And then um, we have the chat box. If you wanted to ask any questions today, you should all, since you're attendees and we're doing this as an event, you should be automatically muted. Um, so really the chat box is the best way to ask a question or make a comment. Um, you can reach out to me directly um, or say it to everyone, um, whatever your preference is, but if, especially for the Q and A. Um, we have six presentations today. The first one is a keynote from Professor Dorn, and then we'll break out into the in individual discipline sessions that are 15 minutes each, and then we'll have time at the end for Q and A for everybody. So. Um, Professor Dorn's questions, Q&A will have a specific time for that um, at the end of his talk. And then for the discipline breakout sessions, we'll have that separate Q&A. So um, any questions for Chuck, ask him right when he's done. Um, and then we'll have the session later on where you'll have time for questions. So before we get started into our presentation, I wanted to um, introduce Dean Whalen to say a few words. Um, she, for nearly 30 years, um, Dean Whalen has supported the College of Allied Health as a faculty member, administrator, and dean. Starting as an adjunct instructor, she worked up to professor with tenure and became the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences Department Head from 2003 to 2012. Tina served as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs from 2012 to 2014 and stepped in as Interim Dean, which led her to her appointment as Dean in 2015. Each unit appreciates her collaborative style and innovative spirit through new program development, support of faculty scholarly endeavors, and accountability to set the college up for success today and in the future. So please welcome Dean Whalen. Well, welcome everyone and um, happy homecoming to all of you Bearcats and to our friends of the college and university. Um, this is an unusual year as we all know, in so very many ways. Um, and so we were not gonna be deterred by that and are back in class, which is an annual event for us, uh, was scheduled to go and our faculty and Bree and the staff support found a way to get this done albeit in a virtual uh, setting. Um, the, the topic, interestingly enough, of telehealth was already selected before we went into what I refer to as the COVID interruption. Um, I am calling it an interruption because eventually we will be beyond this and hopefully back to some sort of what people are calling a new normal, but really able to get back together in person at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. So it is an interruption, in how we normally do our work and our business, but it is not deterred us from being able to make the, the things that we want to have continue go on as scheduled. Uh, so I wanna thank the committee, the back in class group of interdisciplinary faculty in our college who come together to plan this event. Bree is a critical component of making this event go. I think there are some silver linings to this whole thing. And one is that it has allowed us, because we are virtual, to have alumni and friends of the college participate in this event from a further geographic area. Um, typically, when we do it in a face-to-face, -face, we tend to get local folks who come in because we only do it for a half day. Uh, so it would be silly for people to come very far uh, for a half day program. But because we're virtual, we can literally reach out to the whole country and beyond. And so for you Bearcats who are out of the geographic area that is Cincinnati and around, um, welcome. And we're glad that you can join us for this uh, annual alumni event where we all come together and learn to and from each other about topics that apply to all of our, our disciplines. Um, telehealth has uh, been a, a lifesaver um, during this whole pandemic situation, both for students um, who need to get clinical hours in, and I know some of our panelists are gonna discuss that, uh, for clinical care to be delivered. This has been something that um, has just, I think they say necessity is the mother of invention um, that has spurred us into arenas that we have been talking about potentially for a long time, potentially also had some barriers to due to either technology, which may still continue for some of our patients, but also third party payers and that sort of thing. So I think everybody's gonna take a look at this um, as a, a very valid way of reaching our uh, constituents and also the patients who need our services as we move into the future. The technology has been a godsend. I think we've all uh, learned a lot. Um, again, trial by fire for some of us, 
Uh, for some of us more comfortable with that, but we've certainly expanded, I think, our uh, usage of the technology and perhaps our ability to, to manage it. So another silver lining. As far as the college is concerned, about 13 and a half of our uh, classes are being held in a face-to-face -face component when what we're calling a hybrid format. Um, obviously, we do practitioner training in 31 different disciplines. Uh, all of that has a component where there's lab-based, skill-based courses that our students need to learn and practice and be tested for the competency before we can send them out into the clinic. And so those classes are going on. Uh, we, it was a big logistical situation to get them to go, but they're going. Uh, we just are completing our sixth week of fall classes. And so knock on wood, we've completed six weeks of classes and we're hoping to just keep going until the Thanksgiving break when we will finish the semester in an online format with the rest of the university. So really hoping to be able to continue the face-to-face -face classes that are scheduled in the building and so far so good. Uh, from a clinical perspective, you all know that our students have a clinical component, a required clinical component to be able to be ready to sit for licensure or credentialing. We were able to successfully get over 300 of our students back in clinic this summer. Uh, we were able to resume those clinical experiences as early as May. So we adapted to that very rapidly. And if you are in an agency that has taken our students and is continuing to shepherd our students, we thank you so much for your support. This is truly a partnership with our community and we uh, couldn't do it obviously without you. Uh, there's a telehealth piece to that as well, but I'm going to let the other panelists talk about that. Um, this fall, we have over 250 students out in clinical right now. Uh, we're ensuring that they have training before they go, that they understand the PPE. We're ensuring that they have the PPE protection that they need. We're providing that for them. And I'm approving every single clinical placement and the people who are submitting those uh, Excel spreadsheets to me can attest to the fact that we go through this sort of uh, onerous process to get them out there, but I want them to be safe and I want them to be successful in progressing through their program. So the college is really finding other ways to get the work done and allowing our students to continue to make progress in their programs. And that's really why we are here. Uh, we miss our beautiful building. We're going in on a limited basis. I'm usually in the office once or twice a week. Today, I'm in my dining room. Uh, so, but, but Dr. Dorn is, is gonna be in a lecture format for you and he's our keynote. Uh, so I, again, I'm gonna be a participant in this program, just like the rest of you. Looking forward to hearing what our keynote has to say and our panelists have to say about their utilization of telehealth and what the future brings for all of us in our disciplines. So welcome Bearcats and those who aren't Bearcats, we are adopting you for the day and happy homecoming. All right, thank you, Tina. Um, I'll now introduce um, Chuck Dorn, who is our keynote. PowerPoint works. Um, so, Chuck is a research professor and the MPH program director in the Department of Environmental and Public Health Sciences Division of Public Health at the UC College of Medicine. He also has an academic has academic appointments as full professor level in political science at UC, aerospace medicine at Wright State University, and emergency medicine at George Washington University. He is currently on loan as a special assistant to the NASA Chief Health and Medical Officer at NASA Headquarters in Washington, D.C. He serves as the co-chair of the FedTel for the U.S. government. Professor Dorn is a Fulbright Specialist with the U.S. Department of Aerospace Medicine and Telemedicine at NASA Headquarters. He is the principal author of NASA's Integrated Strategic Plan for Telemedicine and served as the lead for NASA's telemedicine activities. Professor Dorn also serves as the Executive Secretary of the Multilateral Medical Policy Board for the International Space Station. He serves as the Director of Global Health Concentration within UC's accredited MPH program. So now we have Chuck Dorn. It almost sounds like an obituary. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Dr. Whalen and uh, Bree, uh, and thank you for attending this session. I actually am in a conference or in a lecture hall in the 
uh, Kettering Complex, which is literally right next door to the uh, brand new Allied Health Sciences building. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of start off by, I think, the, stressing the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, one of the things that I've done in the last, uh, going on almost 18 years now here at UC is this um, working among different colleges. You know, I was, I've been in the College of Medicine for that entire time, but I've been in different departments and also working with um, the MHA program with Dr. Shayette uh, over in Allied Health and, and Debbie Samsel over in nursing and, and Dr. Glazer, the Dean, and of course the deans we've had here in the College of Medicine. And so to me, inter interdisciplinary collaboration is very, very important. And in fact, as, a, as the next uh, 45 minutes to 50 minutes or so unfold, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of those collaborative activities. Next slide, please. So uh, next slide. And so I wanted just to highlight this is I always put this up because these are my thoughts. Um, they're not they're not the government's uh, thoughts. They're not UC's thoughts. Uh, but I'm obviously been at this for for over 30 years now. And it's interesting that, that to watch uh, telehealth and telemedicine unfold. Um, I've been trying to advocate this the entire time I've been here. And, it, and it's amazing how many of the individuals I've interacted with either are where you know they either wear blinders or they don't really think that we need it and of course uh in in middle of march we were hitting the head with a two by four as an entire world and telemedicine and telehealth become uh, commonplace next slide there are two objectives i, I want to talk to you a little bit about or three exact objectives excuse me uh i want to kind of cover some of the background, some of the historical perspectives, uh, look at some of the innovative technologies. Uh, this is a very high level, because uh, I could literally talk for, for hours or perhaps days on some of these things. Next slide. Uh, so this is the world in 2120. Next slide. And in the, and here you see, if you just envision for a minute, that all of the landmass you see is there's no longer any snow. So it's all the snows melted, which means the global temperatures are risen and half of the world now has disappeared. Uh, I shouldn't say half because you can still see a lot, but here we are, the Gulf of Mexico is in St. Louis. Now, why is that important? First of all, is that the, the changing environment in which we find ourselves, whether you believe in global warming or not, that's, that's immaterial for this lecture. But it, the point is, is that it affects our health. It affects uh, global health uh, worldwide. And so you may see entire uh, parts of the world disappear. You can see Bangladesh is no longer uh, uh, no longer there. And so the point here is is that we have to be aware of what naysayers may or may not believe, or what they may or may not say. Just think about wearing masks at the political level. Next slide. So these two images. Why are these important? The one on the um, left uh, is the original stethoscope. Dr. Lenek developed this in 1815 because the standard of care at that time was for the physician to put his, his ear on your chest. Now, most of us don't want the doctor to put his, his or her head on our chest to listen to our lung or heart sounds. So he developed uh, this, basically took a coral of paper, which is about 25 pieces of parchment, rolled it up into a cone and held it against the patient who was able to hear her heart and lung sounds because she did have a cardiac problem. And most of his friends thought he was a complete fool. So it took, it took almost 100 years for the stethoscope to become commonplace. And of course, now it's disappearing because we have advanced imaging and advanced technologies. The second one is hand washing. Dr. Semmelweis in 1845, 1846 time period was teaching anatomy uh, in Vienna. And he went from the anatomy lab to delivering babies. And the, the part he skipped was washing his hands. Now, the, he had a lot of uh, puerperal fever with his patients. A lot of the, the women were passing away uh, unnecessarily, but they didn't really understand bacteria. They didn't understand, uh, certainly didn't understand viruses. And so the idea of change was hard to come by because at this time period, the quote was, gentlemen, don't have dirty hands. And so when you think about the standards of care, it's taken a long time for change to happen unless something bad happens. Next slide. Next slide. So in this slide here, we have uh, some uh, interesting slides that look look historically. So this is 1924. This is 
uh, using a television, which was developed in 1939. The child is talking to his physician with a fax machine, 1971. Uh, radio, of course, has been around for a while, and his, his siblings are kind of laughing at him. But this is really a doctor talking to a patient with telemedicine. This is now called Popular Mechanics, and the awards given out each year for advanced technology are called the Hugo Awards, based on the uh, editor, uh, Hugo Gernsbach. Here's an, another example, 1929, of a physician manipulating a patient at a distant site using uh, haptic interface devices. These we've actually used here at the University of Cincinnati in doing a robotic telesurgery uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and that's a whole other lecture. And of course, you can see some additional inventions. So the, the purpose of these slides is to tell you that there's been a lot of innovation over the years, and a lot of times innovation doesn't really move forward because of leadership or lack of leadership. Next slide. In this uh, particular slide, uh, I started doing this when I was working at NASA in back in the early, early 1990s. In fact, this is a young, much younger me doing a video conference on the World Wide Web with a web-based interface that allowed us to look at both video and audio files. You can clearly see this is a broken limb. And this is this actual limb was in Russia by using the Ilazarov method uh, for fixing the uh, fixing the broken uh, broken limb. And so when we were doing this in 1993, people thought we were crazy. Why? Because the World Wide Web really wasn't very, hasn't really been developed that much at that, this point. This is actually a Netscape 1.0. You can see Netscape here. Netscape, I don't think exists anymore. Now we use Safari, Google, Google Chrome. Um, I mean, Google Chrome, Safari, and Internet Explorer. Uh, Firefox, I think, is another one. And so this concept, doing doing telemedicine on the World Wide Web, really was developed at NASA in that early uh, period of time. And of course, this is, is a picture of the uh, space shuttle dock to the um, Hubble Space Telescope. Next slide. So as the co-chair of the Federal Telemedicine Working Group, now I think maybe almost 10 years now, uh, there was a joint working group created in the 1990s uh, when Vice President Gore and, and President Clinton were looking at how do you use the World Wide Web for government uh, so that you, you could gain access to more information using the World Wide Web. And so this joint working group um, kind of sli slid away for a little while, and then it, it reemerged uh, probably in the 2007, 2008 time period. So as the co-chair, I was asked to help develop a federal definition for telemedicine and telehealth. And we'll talk why there's a difference in terminology. Uh, and so we began to look at that across different agencies and we did an inventory. Uh, we actually wrote a paper, uh, which is cited here, uh, the US government's approach. The reason why it can't be done is because each agency that's somewhat elusive in the sense that the, the VA, the DOD, Department of Defense, uh, NASA and the Indian Health Service all have a unique population, astronauts, men and women in uniform, the warfighter, veterans in the indigenous uh, Indian populations across the United States. HHS has the rest of us, which includes those other groups as well, but they actually uh, have six definitions within their own agencies. So, so just think about that. There, there, there's quite a few different definitions out there, and they change. Each state has one. Each division within states have one. There are even different definitions in our own um, academic health center. Uh, and so we, there's another paper here that was developed. This is by uh, Dr. Sood and uh, some others, including me. What is telemedicine? The collection of 104 peer-reviewed perspectives. And that actually has been the most cited paper uh, in the entire world on the definition and that was published uh, a number of years ago. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so what I th thought was interesting here, I actually grabbed this off of Google. Uh, we've all seen people on our campus at Kroger, Home Depot, a national park, wherever it might be. I just was on a vacation this summer with national parks. And you can see here are physicians wearing masks in 1918. You can see clearly here, the guy's not covering his nose. This one's crooked. And then now there are stories out there that these masks didn't really work at all. Um, and we, we've heard that from both the administration and uh, physicians, and there are a lot of naysayers out there, but clearly wearing a mask, mask is important. But we had limited knowledge at this time about viruses. We didn't really understand this virus until 
you know, maybe 1970s, I suppose. And it also actually came from Wuhan, China as well. Lack of equipment, effective messaging, and misleading actions at all levels. In fact, at the time, the president of the United States, at that time period, we were in the middle of a war. So his messaging was slightly, um, I don't want to say it's obtuse, but it was not as accurate as it could be for a variety of reasons. And it's the same thing today is that, you know, we don't want to put fear in, in, in the population. And, you know, you've heard all these things in the news, but how does, how does healthcare change because of that? What, what's, what's happened in the past? Next slide. So there's a lot of people around uh, our academic health centers, not just ours, but all across the entire country, entire world, that are basically like this. They don't see anything other than what's right in front of them. And the importance, and I'm not denigrating anybody in particular or, or any, any particular department or division or anything like that. The point is, is that there's a lot of knowledge out there, but sometimes people don't pay attention. And in this particular slide, you can see that uh, up until from 1990 to 2019, there were 252 papers written on COVID-19. In telemedicine, there were zero. As of October 2nd, which is today, there were now, I just checked again this morning, there are 60,086, which is um, an increase of 2,000 just in the last week. And then with telemedicine, it's 2138, but that's increased to 2197. That's 65 new papers just in one week. So the point here is, is that there are a lot of people out there. I'm the editor of the Telemedicine eHealth Journal, and I've received on average, usually about 285 manuscripts per year. As of today, I've received 430. And out, out of those, almost 50% are in COVID-19 and telemedicine or telehealth from around the world. And there's a lot of garbage. So, I mean, most of them are rejected straight out. Um, a lot of opinions, a lot of letters to the editor. In, in March and April, those were acceptable, but in October, I need data. I need a lot more data to show the efficacy. So that's why I point, point to the, this point out, it's a rush to publish, I say yikes, and then garbage in and garbage out. Next slide. So telemedicine in the age of COVID-19. Now, up until March, uh, first of 2020, telemedicine has been deployed around the United States for a better part of 50 or 60 years. And it depends on which state and which program, but it's been around for a long time. And some people, or some colleagues have even said it goes back maybe even, even 100 years or so ago with modern telecommunications technology. Uh, but as of April 1st, we've seen tens of thousands of percent increase. There was one paper I got from University of Washington out in Seattle that they did an average of 20 cases by telemedicine per month, and then they jumped 12,000% where they're doing thousands of cases a day and thousands of cases a week, which is a huge increase, right? But I would advocate that we were not prepared, and we're still not prepared, actually, because there's a lot of people pushing out telemedicine solutions that may just be, you know, not grasping at straws, but just trying to do it as fast as they can. There are lots of guidelines. There's a lots of process that the American Telemedicine Association has developed. And so there's a lot of knowledge that can be made there. And I think it's important is, you know, before the pandemic, it depends on who you were listening to and who the decision makers are. And I'll use an example, two examples, actually. In 1921, Charles Kettering in Dayton, Ohio, developed the electric starter for a car, specifically the Cadillac. And he went to the banks in Columbus, Cincinnati, and Dayton to borrow money to build a factory in Dayton, Ohio, to manufacture the starter for the car. All the bankers said, why would we do that? We crank our cars. We don't use a stethoscope. We don't wash our hands. He took his invention to Detroit. Think about that for a minute. So Detroit is the car capital of the world. Not, it's not in Ohio. Second story is the FAA, the precursor to the FAA was in the Department of Commerce. And in 19 early 1930, 32, 33 time period, some people came from Washington to Columbus, Ohio, and asked the city leaders in Columbus to consider building an aero port, aero, A-E-R-O, port, west of the Allegheny Mountains so planes could land, continue west to deliver mail. They said, why would we do that? No one's gonna fly an airplane, so they went to Chicago. Leadership, lack of leadership is very important to understand. Next slide. Next slide. 
So here I want you to, and, and this may be intuitive now is because we've been doing this, but there are basically two types, there's synchronous and asynchronous. So you have real time where I am actually sitting, talking to someone, you saw that in the, in the uh, slide of the radio news. Uh, so I have a physician or a care provider, uh, speech language pathologist, physical therapist, whatever, whoever it might be, talking to a patient across some video link in real time. That's synchronous. And there's all these different tools you can use. Asynchronous is storing for you. So I'm here, I'm a digitize, I'm not digitizing. The, the x-ray is being digitized and being sent for you to look at at a later point. Now, many of you may have very well been to a physician where he, excuse me, he or she hands you the x-rays and say, please walk down the hall and hand this to your uh, physical therapist or your the specialist or whatever. I had that happen with our son up at Westchester Medical Center back when he was in high school as a cross country runner. And I'm like, can't you just look at it on a monitor because I don't believe in that. Next slide. Uh, what I wanted to point out here is we built a strategy. This is actually an award-winning strategy with USAID and the State Department. It's been deployed in places like Kosovo, Albania, Montenegro, um, Vietnam, um, Cabo Verde, and Tajikistan. And so you basically have a needs assessment, right? So we want to make sure we understand what the need is. We're not just responding. That's, that's the American healthcare system. We respond to medical emergencies. We don't prepare for them. We, yes, we educate our providers at all levels, uh, but we're, we're, our model's more of one of being responsive instead of being prepared, right? I mean, we all know we shouldn't sit on the couch, drink a lot of beer and eat pizza uh, every night. That's not probably very smart. Um, so doing a needs assessment and, and all these different tasks are very important. And you can see these have been published a couple of different times. So you initiate the project, you build the project, you operate the project, you transfer the project. Why is this important? This has actually happened in Kosovo where we went from a, uh, a nation that was, it was part of the former Yugoslavia. We took a medical care system that was destroyed because they were ethnic Albanian which meant they were Muslim. The Serbians decided to kill all these people or try to kill them all. And this is the whole Balkans war of the 1990s and NATO bombing that, that was, had been done. So a lot of things were destroyed both by the bombing and by, by the Serbs. <clears throat> so Kosovo now is a independent country recognized by most of the world, uh, this side of the world, the other side of the world, Russia, they don't recognize Kosovo. They still think it's an enclave of Serbia. So we were able to put in an electronic healthcare system in a disaster, and that's very important uh, as well. Next slide. Now, in this slide, when I use this, I got from the Applied Physics Lab at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I've had this for a number of years, and so I always use it to illustrate a point. So you can see here, I, I basically want a tree swing, which we all know is this, a tire attached to a rope on a branch. We all may have had this as a child, uh, or maybe our own children have this in a neighborhood or in our yard or wherever. But you have different people at the table explaining what needs to be done. I want a comfortable chair that I can climb on. So we're going to build a ladder. Uh, this is how the project leader discussed it. And you go all the way through that, how it was supported, how it was documented. Very important. If we don't document what we're doing now in the year of telemedicine and telehealth, we're not preparing the next group of people come after us, whether it's next year or, or 10 years from now. If we don't understand what we did historically through all the, the interdisciplinary uh, people that are there, then we have a problem. Next slide. Uh, so I think it's also important to, to develop a business plan, but not after the fact, right? So when we look at this strategically, we wanna make sure that we develop a business plan that has the operational tasks involved. So we wanna identify what we're doing, we want to provide a service, you know, whatever it is, we're selling soap, uh, Procter & Gamble, or we're selling a car, or we're educating uh, medical personnel or allied medical health personnel. Uh, we know who the competition is. And so this is very important in this business plan. And this, by the way, is a hieratic script written about uh, 3,500 years ago, and you read it from left to right. Obviously, it's, it's in uh, Arabic. Next slide. Uh, this is important to note, 
is if you do it wrong, the, you're going to get a buzzer, right? We've all played this game when we were growing up. If you touch the metal part, you know, his nose uh, illuminates, right? So I think it's important to understand there are many parts to trying to do something. We, we have a strategic initiative as UC Health or the University of Cincinnati. Our mission is to educate the next generation of people, medical doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, engineers, biologists, teachers, whatever it might be. And so we wanna make sure that our methodologies doing that are, are safe and secure, which is obviously in this room I'm looking at, there's no one in this room, but, but empty tables, but each table has a chair where somebody can sit and all the other chairs are marked, don't sit here. So safety is, is paramount, right? We also wanna make sure we continue to train. And as I say, in telemedicine and telehealth, um, there has been a large number of people who have sort of gone out and started doing it with very little training and very little understanding of what to do, what not to do. It's sort of like sink or swim. And sometimes you can throw, be thrown in the water and, and you, can, you can survive and sometimes you start sinking, but somebody will throw a life, uh, a life jacket at you or a life uh, boat. Next slide. So in this particular slide, I wanna talk about cost effectiveness and the importance of cost. If, if your business manager in your entity that you work, whether it's your department or your school says, well, we, you know, we can't afford to do this. That's important by the way, because you know, there's not a zero sum game or it shouldn't be a zero sum game. And a lot of people don't think about opportunity cost, right? If, and I'll use wearing masks as an example. If you wear a mask, it's highly likely you will not contract COVID-19. That doesn't mean you won't, it just means highly likely you won't. If you don't wear a mask, your, your chances go up. If you don't wear a seatbelt, the chances of you being thrown through the windshield increase because you don't wear a seatbelt. The same thing with using someone else's needle, not wearing a condom. These are all public health messages that are very important. And if we don't think about the opportunity costs, we're missing the bigger picture. And so it's not just about buying the devices or buying, um, training some people, it's also about the individual patient paying a lot of money to drive all the way to our campus to be seen by a physician for 15 minutes and drive all the way home. And we see that time and again, and it's not so much a problem here in Ohio, but when you go out to places like in Alaska or Montana or, or some places out west in the middle of nowhere, it takes a while to get somewhere. And being able to have access is very important, which is a whole nother issue because not everybody has access and that actually is a big problem as well. Next slide. So this is a three-legged table. Now, what happens if you take one of the legs out? Table collapses. Now we all can stand on our two feet. And if you have one foot, you can stand for a while, but it's a little uncomfortable. But a table that's designed for three legs will not remain balanced. It'll fall over, right? So what I'm trying to do here is we're looking at the healthcare system that we all live and work in. We have patients, we have providers, and we have the communities in which we serve. We're all part of the community. Some of us are providers and we're all patients. Now, patients and communities are not meant to be the same because the community is the larger catchment area of Cincinnati or Ohio or the tri-state region or our country or our world. And so we need to understand that if we keep it balanced, there are external and internal forces that are pulling and, and pushing, right? That's the whole symbiotic or parasitic relationship. And then you have messaging. If the messaging isn't there or it's poor, uh, we have a problem. Next slide. There are a number of companies out there that are now uh, being uh, developing technology and, and promoting them across the landscape of American healthcare. Some of these companies have been around a while. We all are familiar with some of these. I mean, obviously Walmart, Google, Apple, uh, Teladoc, some of these country, uh, co companies have been around for a long time. They're beginning to look at new, um, new approaches. So I actually suggested to Procter & Gamble and to Kroger about in a me different meetings about 15 years ago that we should develop home health care. Uh, it was a growing market, not interested. I said the same thing to my pharmacist at CVS about when I moved here about 18 years ago, he's like, man, we're not going to do that. And I'll use the story about my own son was born prematurely in 2000 or 19, yeah, 1993. And they had, he was on an apnea monitor. And I asked the lady who's coming to the house, I said, why can't I plug the apnea monitor into the phone and download the data 
because she had to come to the house every three days to download the data. And she looked at me and she knew I worked at NASA at the time, full time in Washington. She goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, it's like a fax machine. You just plug it in and the information goes across the, the network. No idea whatsoever. Today, of course, we have these devices on our phone and we carry them in our pockets or our pocketbooks. Next slide. The next slide. So about four years or so ago, I started asking the folks, in, I was in family medicine at the time, even though I've been in the MPH program since almost the very beginning. I asked somebody, I said, what, what do our medical students and what do our uh, primary care physicians know about telemedicine and telehealth? And it depends on who you ask. Some people know a lot, some people don't know any. So I thought I'd do a study. So there's a two parts to the study. There were two actual different studies. One, I was working with M1s and M2s, first and second year medical students, about what they knew and what they want to know about telemedicine and telehealth, and then are the primary care network within the greater Cincinnati area, which led to the development of this paper, which was published in the a journal. And I looked at what students expect and what doctors expect. And it's really uh, kind of striking that there are a lot of people who were like, no, we're not gonna do this, not while I'm in charge. And I'll use an example. Uh, back when President Bush, uh, when Bush was president, the second Bush, uh, George W. Bush, uh, the person running CMS and the person running the Joint Commission, the Joint Commission, as you know, comes and credits the hospitals and so forth. They were at a meeting on Capitol Hill and the Joint Commission had been developing some guidelines for and credentialing uh, physicians and healthcare workers uh, for their credentialing files within their healthcare facility. And they were talking about uh, telemedicine and in a variety of different you know, mobile health kinds of activities. And the congressional committee really liked what they were talking about. So they asked the CMS guy, you know, can you guys work together to make sure that CMS also does some of the same work? And you, know, you always say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and you, from Congress and you go off and do what you're supposed to do. So the next day they have a meeting and this came from the American Telemedicine Association. I was not at this meeting, but I had heard about this. They had a meeting and the commissioner of the CMS, I forget his name now, says to the commissioner of the Joint Commission, where do you get your money? Well, you know, sir, we get our money from you. And he says, well, good, you'll do exactly what I say and we're not doing this. Leadership, lack of leadership. Next slide. So over the last five or six years, we've had a couple of conferences here at the University of Cincinnati in telemedicine and telehealth. And these are primarily have been uh, a sort of an interdisciplinary collaboration between the Colleges of Medicine, the College of Nursing, with nursing taking the lead with Debbie Samsel and Greer Glazier as the dean. And we've had people from the entire enterprise uh, here at the university, both engineering, uh, arts and sciences, um, GAP, uh, obviously all the academic health center components, children's and the VA. Uh, participate in these conferences. And one of the things in the outcomes, we always ask, you know, would you like additional training? And the answer is that, that would be great. So Debbie Sampson and I went off and developed, this is a picture of Debbie Sampson and I with uh, Vigo, one of the robots out at Maple Knoll Nursing Facility. We developed a telehealth, graduate level telehealth certificate program, which is one of the first ones in the entire United States. And that actually allows us to now train uh, individuals who are already uh, in their postgraduate, undergraduate level education. So a nurse, a uh, speech language pathologist, an IT person, a, an engineer, you know, you know, a master's in healthcare administration, whatever it might be, they may find a lot of utility in taking this graduate level certificate program. Uh, the courses, there's four courses that are listed here. It's kind of hard to see, but I believe you have the slides. Uh, the courses are listed. Uh, right here. I teach two of them and Debbie teaches the other two from nursing and they're both, my two courses are within the MPH program and they can also be elective. And I think I have a couple of allied health student, PhD students taking the class this uh, fall semester. Next slide. And next slide. So I wanted to just kind of leave, not leave you, I'm not quite finished just yet, but the patient is the center of everything we do. My son's a hand surgeon and some surgeons believe they're the center of everything. I'm not picking on surgeons. And I've talked to him about a little bit about that. He said, you know, Dad, we're really em embracing telemedicine and telehealth in orthopedics. 
Uh, we see it in, in dentistry, by the way, as well, in pathology. We see it in all kinds of different disciplines. But I want you to, to make sure you to, to realize that the patient's the center, but the patient and the way we treat our patients are influenced by policy, by providers, by payers, and by technology, such that in some states before March 1st, 2020, some states just basically told their providers, their um, insurance providers, we are going to bill you for telemedicine, period, and you're going to pay for it. And California did that. Wisconsin did that. Uh, Virginia has done some of that. Ohio, not so much. Today, of course, it's different because the president signed executive orders, which allowed it to be reimbursed. So it's influenced uh, by some of these other things, payment, legislation, fear, and geography. And these all impact the way we provide healthcare. Next slide. Here, uh, I mean, again, we could talk about chronic disease um, for the rest of the day, but I think it's important to note that you can apply telemedicine and telehealth to everything we do. The University of Cincinnati was the first university in the entire world to do have two Da Vinci robots, and we actually demonstrated in 2005, you could actually operate on an animal in California from here. We got a new chairman of surgery. He said, I don't believe in that. We stopped doing it. So we're no longer number one, leadership. So you, you have here uh, an old, you know, old slide of the way we used to do things, and of course the new thing. And so, so the idea here is, is that we are becoming more and more aware as consumers of what the possibilities are. And with COVID-19, we've seen this huge uptick in telemedicine and telehealth, and we've seen this great uh, activity uh, moving forward. Next slide. In this slide, I just wanted to highlight a couple of your colleagues. Uh, I, many of you know Dr. Lisa Kelchner and Casey Keck and Pauline Mashima. These um, are three papers that I was involved in um, with those colleagues in, in your college. Uh, Pauline uh, is actually out in Hawaii. Uh, we actually uh, wrote a paper about the overview of telehealth and speech language pathology. That's the most cited paper in telemedicine, telehealth in speech language pathology. And this one I wrote with Casey, this is actually part of her, these were both part of their PhD thesis. Uh, and Casey is a, uh, in faculty down in uh, Georgia somewhere. And um, this one here was really important because it was a partnership with Children's Hospital in pediatric speech language pathology. Next slide. The importance of this next slide here, this is actually comes from that paper with, with Lisa and with Casey is that when we designed this, we sat down with the IT people, and I have, there's a whole bunch of examples here, but I'm only going to use this as one, is that we wanted to make sure that the designer of the website was on the same page as we, as clinicians or project managers or program managers. And of course, this was the final, what the final thing looked like. But initially, if you tell somebody, I want you to move the boxes from this point, this part of the room to that part of the room. That's all you say, they move the boxes. But if you say you want to put in, in, a, in, a, in a location by size and by the, the date that's on the side, then it's a different approach. So it's, it's that communication that has to be done to make, stir, make sure it's done in the correct way. Next slide. Many of the things we do um, are very advanced. Uh, you can see the complexity uh, here. You have artificial intelligence now. This is a robot that's actually on space station now. This robot does certain tasks that it's programmed to do. Uh, this is obviously from a movie. This is one of the Star Wars movies. But the robot is the one delivering the babies. I mean, the woman is the one delivering the baby, but the robot is assisting. Is this possible? Yes, it's possible. Is it something we'll accept? I'm not sure we'll accept it today, but we might in the future. And there are technologies that you can, this is a cartoon, but you can actually print organs now, grow organs. Now it's in the lab and it's not really for prime time, but these things are happening. And of course, you can see the very uh, detailed complexity of, of an operation. This is the um, actual cockpit of a, um, a, fighter, a fighter jet, or it could be the cockpit of a um, spacecraft. So here we have smart systems, autonomous systems, sensors, robotics, 3D printing. All these things are here and now, and they're influencing the way we do, the way we practice. Certainly, if you think about it, if what we are experiencing right now in 2020 
happened in 1995, there is no way we'd be able to do what we're doing today. From, from the distance learning uh, to computers, to communication, these technologies, while they did exist back then, I showed you a video earlier, or I mean a, a photograph earlier of me doing a video conference in 1994, 1993, 1994 time period, but the, the quality and the efficacy we do it today was not possible back then. Next slide. And this is just a image of the complexity of, this is a Da Vinci robot uh, over the patient. Some people think, well, the robot's doing the work. No, the surgeon's doing the work, but you can see how complex these uh, situations become. Next slide. So in the last few slides, I just want to talk a little bit about the resources. So here we have uh, two executive orders signed by President Trump that basically permits the reimbursement of telemedicine and telehealth uh, nationwide uh, well into the future. Now, as a co-chair of the Federal Telemedicine Working Group, I've often asked the CMS people why they don't reimburse telemedicine. And you get all kinds of different answers. Well, there's not enough data. We don't believe in it. Uh, it's not the way I was trained. You know, there's all kinds of excuses, but COVID-19 is not an excuse. It's a reality. It's provided us the well, it doesn't provide the benefit. It's provided us an opportunity to grow and explore new ways of doing things. Just like not that we want to develop a, and prosecute a war, war on terrorism, Vietnam War, the World War II, but those events helped us build a better trauma system. So unfortunately, these these events occur in human history that drive change, drive technology, and drive new ways of doing things. And that's exactly what we're living through right now. Uh, these are just happen to be two of our leaders, DeWine and President Trump. I'm not sure why he has a smirk on his face, but uh, clearly this is a White House physician explaining to him how telemedicine, telehealth works. Next slide. There's a lot of evidence now, as I pointed out earlier, there's uh, tens of thousands of articles written just in the last a uh, couple of months uh, on COVID-19 related to telehealth and telemedicine. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of journals that, that are out there. I'm the editor of this journal. Um, we have a new cascade journal called Telemedicine Reports. Uh, so if you're interested in publishing or have some uh, great data and would like to see it, there's obviously specialty journals as well, and they go across the entire world. These two journals happen to be the oldest. They're both in their 20, entering their 27th year in January. Uh, I've been the editor of this for 16 years. Next slide. There's also a lot of textbooks. Uh, this, um, and I, I'm actually either the editor or involved in every one of these. Uh, this one comes out in uh, around Christmas time, uh, which was Dr. Latifi and, and Dr. Merrill. Uh, I'm the editor of this one on space physiology, which is really talks about telemedicine, the very early part of the space program. Uh, I wrote a chapter in family medicine, so every family medicine physician trained in the United States will use this book. Uh, this one's about the dialogue between engineers, life scientists, and physicians. And you know that these people are never on the same page, right? That's why you, you it's called the Rosetta Stone. But you have right here, the, the, the astronaut's in the middle, but the astronaut could be the patient, could be the junior faculty member. It could be anybody for that matter. And the idea is, is that an engineer can take something and test it to destruction. We can't do that with a patient. And we have to understand how do we develop the technology that allows us to provide the best healthcare without destroying the patient. Engineers, they don't speak the same terminology as, as we do in the medical profession. Next slide. The government has created a, a series of telehealth resource centers. Uh, and you can see by, by looking at the, the logos for each one are, are around the, the map of the United States, Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, why is attached to, Cal not attached to California, but is linked to the California Center and Alaska is attached to the uh, one that's up here in uh, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and a little bit of Utah. And ours right here is to the Indiana Rural Health Association. And these resource centers allow us, allow us to find information that may or may not be in the literature and may or may not be within uh, our associations. Now, the American Telemedicine Association has been around for a, quite a long time, almost, um, it started in 1994, so about 27 years. It's interesting, it, it actually was developed the day after my son was born prematurely, so I, I may have the details like memorized. Uh, but you can find all kinds of really awesome information there, and sometimes uh, we've had 
the folks at our center participate in our conferences. Next slide. Uh, so this um, I thought would be interesting. Uh, this is a quote by Winston Churchill. To improve is to change, to be perfect is to change often. And a lot of times, I think the way in which we train, the way in which we do our training, the we were trained individually, or the way we train our next generation of leaders, is that it's influenced by our experiences, it's influenced by what's going on in the real world, and it changes. But I think it's important to know also we need to get our heads in the right place. Now, with that, I just wanted to um, next slide. So, you know, we need to add your own phrase. Now, I've been using the term telemedicine and telehealth interchangeably. Telemedicine is really focused on medical care by doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, pharmacists. Uh, they use, they like to use the word telehealth, use the word telehealth because it's more encompassing. Now, the term telehealth has been around for quite a long time. The term telemedicine actually was coined by uh, Dr. Ken Bird at uh, Mass General Hospital in the, in the mid 60s. Now, Jay Sanders, who is a very well known individual in the area of telemedicine, uh, was the uh, kind of the founding member of the American Telemedicine Association, was actually a chief president at the time uh, at the Mass General. And Ken Bird was on his way in the Sumner Tunnel to the airport in the Logan Airport in Boston to see patients at a clinic out there. He got stuck in traffic, got frustrated, turned around and came back to the hospital. He came walking through the, in the emergency room doors, the doors fly open, and he was cussing and swearing as, why can't I see my patients, blah, blah, blank, blank, blank. Why can't I use the television or the telephone to see patients? He goes, why can't we call it telemedicine? And so that's sort of where the term it came from. Now, he did not invent the word. He didn't invent the, the concept, but that's really where the idea came from. So with that, uh, let me go to the next slide and thank you for uh, taking a listen. Uh, I hope I covered a lot of information and I have a few, few minutes, I think, for questions. Bree, back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Dorn. That was really great, um, really interesting overview. It's, I always say when I attend these, I'm not a practicing clinician, so it's all kind of a new world and um, even literally took us out of this world up to space. So um, thank you so much for your holistic insight. We do have, we'll take a few minutes for questions. Um, this is the time to ask him since the Q&A later would just be for our discipline. So if you have any questions, please type in the chat. Um, and if none are coming to you right this moment, feel free to send them later um, and I can com communicate with him directly. Um, any questions? So will you want to go ahead and pass the quiz out now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> test. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you so much again for your time preparing all this and being present to support our um, our college's Welcome. program. I think it's you know, it's always really great to see the amazing partners we have within just right here within the UC community and right across the street and or even you're kind of our new neighbor yep, um, yep. with your office. So um, thank you so much. And you're welcome to stay on, obviously. And, and like I said, if I um, if questions come to you all you know, throughout the presentation, you know, just put it in the chat still and I'll communicate with him privately and follow up with you. So yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can send my email to anybody and, and everybody if you sure. want, and, and I can certainly answer questions after. I actually am going to go do a few more things. Um, you know, deadlines of manuscripts and teaching classes are always challenging. So uh, best of luck with the rest of the conference. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Whalen, for the opportunity to speak to your uh, alumni and um, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and meet you, Chuck, <laughs> and then um, pull up our next presenter. So I'll read her quick bio. Um, so Erin Rudel Sizemore is a speech language pathologist and assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. She has over 15 years of experience working with individuals with a range of pediatric and adult communication and swallowing disorders in a variety of settings including acute care, home health, and outpatient settings. At UC, Dr. Riedel is the program director for the Akron Cincinnati Online Learning Collaborative, 
Program in Speech Language Pathology and the Director of the University of Cincinnati Speech and Hearing Clinic. Among her research interests are knowledge transition, sorry, knowledge translation and quality improvement. She has presented on these topics at local, state, and national conferences. So, Erin. Good morning. Um, thank you, Bree and um, Dean Whalen and the college for inviting me to talk today. Um, I, as I get started, I want to echo Dean Whalen's comments earlier. If you are a community provider who is currently hosting one of our students for their clinical practicum, or you've done that in the past, we greatly appreciate your um, support and partnership. So thank you for that. <clears throat> All right, Bree, next slide, please. So um, Professor Dorn just gave us a great review and overview of telehealth. So some of these points um, you've already heard this morning. Um, it occasionally is referred to, we as speech pathologists do tend to call it telehealth. Um, occasionally within our profession, you may also hear it referred to as teleservices, telepractice, or remote service delivery. Um, fortunately, in both speech language pathology and audiology, um, the use of telehealth was vetted prior to the onset of the pandemic. So it is discussed the effectiveness of telehealth as a mechanism for service delivery is discussed as early as 1999 for speech language pathology and around the same time for audiology. And in 2013, the American Speech Language Hearing Association actually started developing um, guidelines and best practices for speech pathologists and audiologists to use in this area. And Ohio has actually been at the forefront of many telehealth applications related to speech language pathology um, and audiology. Um, Dr. or Professor Dorn mentioned uh, Lisa Kelchner, who's a former faculty member here um, at UC who did some work in um, telehealth and we'll look a little bit more at some of her work later. Um, and then there's also been a group um, at Kent State that has done some um, kind of pioneering work both in audiology and speech language pathology. Thank you. Um, in terms of what do we know is effective um, or what conditions can we treat effectively using telehealth? Um, in speech language pathology, we actually have evidence supporting the use of telehealth for speech disorders. So um, this is, you know, a condition that people typically think about when they think of speech pathologists, they, you know, improve children's speech. So instead of saying rabbit, the child says rabbit. Um, but we know that it also works with adults who've had strokes who their speech patterns are changed because of the damage to their neurological system. Um, we have evidence that telehealth improves language disorders. And again, this is in both pediatrics and in adults. Um, this can also be related to reading and writing. So different um, educational uh, sites have used telehealth, actually several educational sites have used telehealth as a way to help um, with disorders in school-based settings as well. Cognitive disorders, so uh, our adult patients typically who are aging and have cognitive deficits could also be the result of a traumatic brain injury. Telehealth is an effective uh, service delivery mechanism for those individuals. Oftentimes with cognitive disorders, depending on the severity of the disorder, the patient on the patient end will require a partner or uh, somebody to kind of help get them into the setting, but then we can use the interventions to directly address cognition as well. Voice disorders, uh, Dr. Or Professor Dorn mentioned earlier, um, Lisa Kelchner's work, she has done a, a kind of some of the pioneering work in looking at using uh, telehealth for, for voice disorders. So um, pediatrically, we see a lot of it here in Cincinnati because we have such a strong ENT program at Children's. It's one of the best, if if not the best uh, pediatric program in the world, and they do a lot of laryngotracheal reconstruction surgeries. So they literally rebuild the airways of many of these children. Um, so they have, you know, very severe voice disorders. And the experts in this, not just the ENTs, but the speech pathologists who work alongside them are here in Cincinnati and are able to provide services literally around the globe to help those patients. Fluency disorders or stuttering disorders, speech pathologists are using telehealth to influence that. Dysphagia or swallowing disorders, there's evidence that connecting with an SLT through a computer can actually help your swallowing. And then resonance disorders, so these are often children who are born with cleft lip and palate um, who have repairs and we're working on improving their speech after those repairs. 
There's also a, a nice body of evidence to support that it can be effective across a variety of clinical settings. So not just schools um, or not just hospitals, but clinics, basically all settings that speech language pathologists work in. Um, and you know, I mentioned earlier that speech that in Ohio, this is not something that's new. So actually in um, around 2012, the state of Ohio started to authorize uh, that Medicaid could be billed for speech pathology services in the schools. So there are um, not many people know, but speech, OT, occupational therapy, and physical therapy that are delivered in educational settings can also sometimes be billed to Medicaid for children who are Medicaid eligible for additional funding for the school to provide those special services. There are not many states that allow school-based services delivered via telehealth to be billed to Medicaid. But Ohio has been allowing this for years, and it's really allowed Ohio to be a leader in ensuring that our children receive best practice, best services in school-based settings. Next slide, please. So um, I think actually this isn't going to quite work, Bree, because I don't know why they're supposed to fly in. So there's, um, so behind, actually, this will work. So behind, yeah. Um, so this is actually an example of, um, well, we'll just kind of talk through it. This is an example of um, green screens that speech pathologists have been using over the summer. So it's been really fun and interesting to watch um, clinicians, you know, as speech pathologists, we typically have a patient sitting in front of us and we have materials that we use to keep them engaged. Um, particularly children who need, you know, some extra motivation to kind of keep going. Um, and in this this example here, this is a, a therapist who's done, um, she's actually published, you know, several YouTube videos on how to use a green screen. But in the top left-hand side, you can see she, her, she set her green screen to actually look like she's reaching into the water to pull out different items to help the child practice specific speech sounds. And in the bottom right-hand corner, she is using um, the facial expressions of a potato head to help gauge or help teach emotion. So you can see she has kind of a concerned look on her face. The potato head doesn't look very happy. And then there's also a barometer on to help measure the, the um, potato head's feelings and to help try to teach children about the emotions and the language that goes with those emotions. Go ahead. And this particular one I thought was just kind of funny. So this is again a speech pathologist trying to use something to keep a, the child engaged and instead they're being swallowed by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Next slide, please. So in audiology, we also know that there is evidence to support that services can be delivered well. Um, hearing can be assessed um, with a thorough hearing evaluation or a potential just a hearing screen through telemedicine. One of the things I do want to point out to, um, to everyone is that this is not the, you know, 299 app that you download from the app store that will check to see if your hearing is working well or not. These are typically programs that are developed with um, audiology and the ENT and they're um, utilized and interpreted by qualified providers. Another area that uh, telemedicine or telehealth can be used with audiology is follow up for hearing loss. So both in terms of pediatrics and in terms of adults, um, Ohio and every other state in the nation and now have laws, I believe it's every other state, that require that infants have their hearing checked um, or, or tested before they leave the hospital to ensure that they don't have hearing loss. If a child has a hearing loss and it's not caught until later, it can have some devastating effects on their development of speech language and literacy. So the, um, we know that this is something that's very important. What has been an interesting challenge, and Lisa Hunter at Children's has studied this um, as well, is that these children are identified as having hearing loss, but it takes an extended period of time to help actually get them the intervention that they need, whether that's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Um, you know, there's, there's a delay in the delivery of the interventions that are needed. And so telemedicine is an avenue to help connect with these families earlier. You can also use telemedicine to help adjust hearing aids, fit both the fitting of them and or the adjustment of the frequencies that individuals can hear. So I'm not an audiologist, so bear with me as I explain this here, but I learned this over the summer 
that um, the hearing aid manufacturers have now developed programs where you can have a three way connection between a patient, the hearing aid provider, um, and typically it's not really actually a person, it's just their um, kind of control center, if you will, and the audiologist. And let's say a patient may say, I'm having difficulty hearing my wife, um, you know, she has higher frequency voices, they can, you know, remotely access that patient's hearing aid and adjust the frequencies of the bandwidth that the hearing aid is picking up and enhancing, um, which is actually really neat. And we used a lot of that this summer in our clinic, which I'll talk about more, where patients, you know, would typically would need to come into our clinic to receive services, were able to have these changes made from the comfort um, and safety of their own home this summer. And then finally, oral rehabilitation. So how we train individuals with hearing loss um, to improve their hearing and to um, improve their perception of speech. Next slide, please. And these are just some pictures of some different examples. Um, this top picture here is taken from an article looking at children in, um, actually in Africa, in a remote area in Africa, who are being fitted for a hearing aid and they are conducting a, a joint evaluation with an audiologist uh, here in the United States. Next slide, please. This is, I mentioned earlier, this um, follow up for children who have hearing loss. This is a, a provider who is working with the family to help coach um, the, looks like the grandmother and or mother of a young child, how to um, optimize conditions for hearing, speech and language development. And next, please. And then finally, um, this is another example. So having a certified and skilled audiologist is a crucial component of ensuring that hearing services are, are delivered effectively. And for people who may be in remote hospitals or somewhere where they don't have an audiologist on staff, telemedicine is used or telehealth is used to help connect these individuals to qualified providers. Thank you, next slide. So benefits of, of telehealth, and again, similar to what Professor Dorn referred to earlier, um, you know, I use the word should because we'll talk about how some of this um, is kind of a double-edged sword, but it should help with shortage of providers, particularly in remote locations or rural areas in the United States where we just don't have enough providers. There's a shortage of speech language pathologists around the country, but tell it there are companies now that do um, a lot of contracting work to help ensure that schools and clinics are able to hire um, appropriately credentialed individuals. It also helps improve access to specialists. I mentioned that earlier that Cincinnati Children's has one of the best ENT programs, that the people who are highly specialized in those areas can, as long as they're licensed appropriately, you know, practice across state lines. So it, as he was talking about earlier, instead of, you know, somebody having to drive in, maybe we have a family that lives in Indiana and they can receive services online with, with their provider. And then it, it mentioned it, you know, cuts down on um, travel constraints for patients and families. And in some ways it, it does help with cost effectiveness, particularly in things like early intervention where the speech language pathologist may be driving around to individual homes instead of having, you know, an hour drive or half an hour drive between patients, it could cut down time in between patients to um, about 10 minutes. I will say that um, one of the things that's coming up for providers, so for us as, as the clinicians on the back end, is that having, you know, we're used to having back-to-back -back patients in a clinical setting, and, and we're used to that because the, the children or the patients, adults are in front of us, but these back-to-back -back settings that are running, you know, on a computer screen all day long are proving to be, um, they're, they may be cost effective, but it, there's also a cost benefit to the fatigue that it is bringing out in some of the providers. Next slide, please. Um, challenges, and Professor Dorn also mentioned this, you know, access to services. So um, there's definitely a digital divide. Uh, there are families that don't have access to different devices that might be optimal for delivering telehealth. You know, internet access is a, is a challenge um, for many families, particularly, again, those who live in rural places who may be the ones who benefit from telemedicine or telehealth the most. Um, and then also specific conditions. So we know, um, and we've learned even more so, that there are some conditions such as children with um, highly complex autism. We run an ultrasound R program where we actually use a, a physical ultrasound probe. There are some conditions that um, cannot be treated 
using these um, using these uh, telehealth uh, practices. Next slide, please. And then finally, I wanted to just touch on the UC Speech and Hearing Clinic. So we are very fortunate that we did work with um, Dr. Kelchner prior to her leaving. We had tested and vetted the use of some tele, um, telehealth for speech therapy and audiology prior to the pandemic. We had a handbook um, that was developed. We had worked through several procedures. And so when we were forced to go remote, we were able to quickly pivot and start delivering services um, remotely. I wanted to um, kind of highlight that in our clinic this summer, we did offer free services for speech language pathology, and we offered um, primarily telehealth, a little bit of in-person services as well for audiology, because again, it's, it's not a, um, appropriate for 100% of conditions, but our speech was completely remote this summer. Um, and we, in an effort to train our students, so our primary goal in our speech and hearing clinic is to provide um, quality training to our graduate students, but our parallel mission is to provide quality services to the community. And we um, needed to ensure that we were going to have adequate opportunities to train our students, both our first year students who were still learning their clinical skills and our second year students who were getting ready to graduate and many lost their external placements because of the pandemic. And so we were fortunate that the department and the college were able to allow us to provide free services to the community this summer. And we worked to partner with Sensei Public Schools to really try and help deliver those services to the communities that need it the most. Um, I mentioned that we had some challenges with access and digital divide. You know, we had children who were accessing speech on their um, cell phones because they don't have tablets or they don't have computers, but we were fortunate they were able to, um, to join us as well. And we, this summer, delivered over 600 teletherapy sessions and trained over 75 graduate students. Um, and, you know, one kind of benefit or one um, plus of the pandemic is that now all of our graduate students are experienced with telehealth and will be able to take those skills with them as they start their careers um, and, delivering, and delivering telehealth services. We are still primarily remote in our clinic. Um, it, all of our adult patients are being seen using telehealth. The majority of our pediatric patients are as well, except for in special circumstances. And audiology is similar. If it can be done through telehealth, uh, we'll do it that way. But if we need a physical appointment, we are open for appointments. So if you do have any speech or hearing needs, I encourage you to, to contact our clinic. Um, and then next slide, thank you. Can you see the references slide? Yes, that, and that's thank you. All right. So questions are at the end, right? Three. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. So yeah, if um, go ahead and start writing questions in the chat now, and then we can address them later. But um, no, thank you so much, Aaron, for how you just you know pivoted on the ground in our clinic in the building, and um, and then you know going remote and still equipping our students with what they need. I really love hearing about that adaptation and, and then the prior research too that um, was kind of laid laid the groundwork by Lisa Kelchner and um, just the strength of our program is just really impressive and uh, really appreciate your time today. Um, yeah, so we'll keep moving along, but like in, I, I see that we see a, um, a question right now. So I'll start tabulating those and we'll address them later. So um, thank you, Erin. So next we'll move to, um, let me get out of the, Slideshow. Um, we're going to move on to our social work session. Um, so, welcome to Lone Vo. Um, she is a PhD candidate at the Smith College School for Social Work. She teaches clinical social work as an adjunct instructor for the UC School of Social Work within the College of Allied Health Sciences at UC. She is a private practitioner providing mental health care to diverse clients experiencing psychosocial stressors life transitions and adjustments, as well as major mental illness. So welcome and um, thank you for being here. Good. Um, and just a very quick caveat in the beginning that uh, I don't uh, in practice that it seems like we are encountering a lot of challenges and want to just take up the space to um, 
to also connect with other social workers who are experiencing some of these. The innovation in and of itself is telehealth. Um, so, so I, I, I am going to talk a little bit about some ways in which we can bridge this. We can use telehealth and uh, use what we know um, that is part of our social work bias, the way that our social work framework to, to make this work. Okay, so um, as you see on your screen, this is, um, I felt like a perfect little picture that captured what happened for us when the pandemic start and the panic pandemic of two kinds, right? In the beginning, it was the COVID-19 and then gradually through the summer that we also saw the pandemic that is um, um, racism and oppression that is within our society. So, and what would you say is the source of your stress that in this way, this is the first time where the COVID-19 pandemic actually swept through in the world and in the US, and it endangers physical, mental health, and social well being of everyone, right? We're all kind of affected to some degree. And surely, as always, the most vulnerable among us is the one who is most stressed and most affected. Um, so, but um, in this situation, the you can see all fish or all of us are affected by the stress uh, in some ways. So social workers have long been in the trenches. We work and serve for the most vulnerable population, but this is the first time that the imminent danger is also affecting us. I have clients who um, in the beginning would come in and right away ask me, how is this going for you? Um, not only in the health and health and social well-being, because if I were to be affected in some way with COVID, that that has direct implication for them. And the other thing that was really interesting prior to this, even though my social, um, racial and social identity is very much apparent and is very present in the room, lots of time people don't talk about this, um, but following COVID and following um, the anti-Asian sentiments that come through that some of my clients then come in and actively and um, immediately worried about my well-being in terms of the anti-Asian um, sentiments. So those are some of the things that uh, come to the forefront. Um, so um, in the beginning, um, we all sort of there with our clients that there's instability insecurity of basic physical health and basic needs, right? Um, even we are, we're right there with our clients in terms of um, needing to secure um, PPE, um, hand sanitizers, even um, ways and um, cleaning supplies to make sure that our office is clean. There's general lack of information about the virus and about a system of care that we can actually rely on to get information to to sustain our understanding of what's going on. So as providers, it's also difficult to then hold our own anxiety about this whole process. So um, in social work, we talked a lot about the use of self in that who we are and what we know or our own values and our own ethics and our own system of beliefs comes into the room with us when we work with our clients. And um, personally, if we are also worried about how things are for ourselves, our family, and society at large, we have to work really hard then to manage that anxiety in the room when we are working and providing treatment for our clients. Um, so I think Erin was talking earlier about different challenges in her respective field the same for us, um, that the individual challenge that is both for the client and for the social worker in the room is palpable in terms of so often in those early months that the client um, would talk about the implication of the, the pandemic and COVID and everything else that is outside of the treatment room um, in the session that the social worker then often left with how much of this is for, for us, for 
me to keep with in the room? And how much um, am I, um, is the client using what's going on out there and not then, um, then not talk about other issues, intrapsychic and psychosocial issues that um, that's affecting them. So people talked about their own anxiety and symptoms, um, but the pandemic actually um, intensified because it whatever symptoms that they had previously, whatever issues that they had that they brought in to work now um, is increased um, substantially that whatever the vulnerabilities that they have before and whatever coping strategies that they used before um, may not work or may be severely impaired. So for some clients, um, if they had already um, having issues with substance use, so alcohol use uh, intensified just because of the isolation and the loneliness and this Incidentally, alcohol was something that they could still access and could still easily get um, in order to then support um, powerful ways that they cope. The normal structures where people congregate in place of worship or gym or other ways that people had lived um, is impaired or it's, is impacted in a way that they cannot go there and get the resources and the support that they need. So the impact on family and social relationships, and um, that's something that we would talk about in the relationship of work in the therapeutic relationship as well. Um, and because the, the governor um, shutting down a lot of the in person's um, face to face meeting. Some of the sessions cannot be held as we did before. Um, I had a client on the last session where we would meet face to face as we were talking about how to transition to a, a virtual kind of session. Um, she was talking about how, yeah, that's fine, but she was crying a long time and saying over and over how the tissues in my office were really soft and were really good. And, you know, um, that's something that we use then to talk about what is it that is in this room that was helpful to the client. And apparently for her, um, this tissue that became a focal point at that moment um, was really helpful. We could take that and she said, well, yeah, you know, sometimes the tissue is not the tissue. Um, but we talked about what is it that is meaningful in the relationship and how do we then carry that um, over to the virtual setting. So, um, part of my work then. Um, require that I have to think about the different innovative strategies where um, I would still replicate that relationship in the in-person sessions um, virtually. At first, um, it took a long time um, to determine which um, platform is, is um, compliant and that it can still allow for the confidentiality and the uh, support that the clients need. There are different platforms out there. Uh, in the beginning, many people used uh, Zoom, and then we found out that Zoom is not um, uh, confidential enough. So, the, in the beginning, it was difficult to actually determine well, uh, how do I use certain kind of platform? And then, how do I, um, for some of the clients, just like in other uh, disciplines, that the availability of technology was also um, an issue for many clients. Um, there was a client I have who said, I have the technology, but I don't have the space in my house to be able to meet with you privately. Um, so then she ended up meeting with me from her car that she would park um, outside of my office. And so the way in which this pandemic made a difference is that 
we both, the clinician and the client, have to work together to identify the way to, to make it work. Right? Theoretically, I had worked in a very relational, psychodynamically informed kind of practice where um, the client is the focus and what it is that she needs to work on or they need to work on. And at the same time, the focus on my use of myself and the dynamic between the two of us is part of the treatment. And so when we are not in the room, um, that the space becomes important. Um, so that becomes something that we talk about immediately. How do we manage this? Um, I had another um, colleague who worked with a client again. Everything that we have to talk about is um, what are the needs that are specific to the client. Um, a colleague of mine who worked with a client who had um, a lot of difficulties after um, a partner suicided. And so the client's in, in severe acute stress and time um, for her that she needed to see my colleague. and. Um, but we were not able to see people face to face. So both of these people had to work through and find a way of meeting in a way that is safe. Um, so she actually reached out to, to the board and reached out to her consultants and supervisor where they came up with a plan that she and her client would meet um, in a park and they brought two lawn chairs and they sat six feet apart. Um, and the client said it was necessary and it was important to see her so that they can um, be talking about what was going on, what was stressful for the client and having the clinician there um, in person rather than um, across the screen. So there's a lot of work that we continuously um, still adapt with um, the telehealth. So, we have to serve the client where they are and what it is that they need to do. So I, I was telling Bree before that the innovation is there, that the technology, but how do we um, make use of it is important. So the social workers then need to re-examine how they work and what theoretical framework that they work from and how to adapt that um, to make sure that the need of the client is still uh, in place. We had to consider the issue of social justice that the client is dealing with. Again, the issue of technology may be um, on some way, um, we think everybody has access and yet the bandwidth for different clients different. The importance of human relationship, how do we work across these virtual screens? One of the way that I, deal with that is actually going into my office and seeing the client from my office, but virtually. And surprisingly, many clients see that right away and, and expressed a lot of relief that they see the room and the office that they're familiar with. Um, so these are some of the very, very um, basic ways that we still need to be able to attend to the needs of the client. Um, so, um, some of the things that I, I think uh, consequently that is really wonderful that happened and that the opportunities is that because of this pandemic, it makes us have conversation um, around what is the core essential needs for each of the people, not only our clients, but also us, um, the essential workers out here so that the conversation around mental health and healthcare and mental health um, is is core, and that they are interconnected and not separate. Um, that conversation around mental health care. So there's access. On the one hand, technology allowed us to reach further, reach for more clients. So clients previously who may not have access because of issue of rural, rural um, locations or because of their own social stigma um, for many clients who are marginalized, that in order 
that they can actually meet clinicians who are competent in that area of practice easier. Um, so these conversation actually is um, really exciting to, for us to have. Um, and then the conversation around making mental health accessible um, through these technology that we have to change our mindset around how do we deliver service and not just in person and face to face setting. Um, we could go on, but I know that I am running out of time. And if you have other questions, and I'll um, address them later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I um, appreciated the greater context that I think social work always offers really well of, you know, understanding the whole person and, you know, Yes, the technology and the how is a really important tool to examine and, and the innovation piece, but I think your point about getting back to the why and the core um, factors that you're dealing with here for each individual is just so crucial to understanding the best pathway for that person. So um, no, that was a really great point. So yeah, we'll, um, we had a question during your session too, so I'll direct that to you later, but thank you so much for your insight and perspective. All right, so next up, we have Beecher Watson. I am, Bree. Perfect. All right, so got your slides pulled up. I'm going to read your bio now. So, um, Beecher Watson is the Chief of Telehealth Services at Cincinnati VA Medical Center and the owner and founder of Telehealth of a telehealth consulting agency, ADPIE Consulting LLC. Ms. Watson serves as a major in the United States Air Force Reserves and serves as officer in command of a behavioral health unit of the 445th Aeromedical Staging Squadron in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. Ms. Watson has over 15 years of experience in nursing and executive leadership roles. Previous positions include medical surgical nurse manager, behavioral health nurse, substance abuse nurse case manager, and director of telehealth services. She has been instrumental in ensuring more than 7,000 patients receive health care annually. Ms. Watson has become an expert in managing and initiating telehealth care across the healthcare continuum. She received a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from UC and earned Masters of Nursing Informatics in 2014. So welcome, uh, Petra. Um, I know we've been sitting for a while, so I would like to check everybody's pulse. If you can just hit the the raise your hand button and, and get up and, and stretch and let me know that you're still there, still hanging in there with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I see Danny and Shayla and Tina and Sarah. Everybody's raising their hands. Thank you for um joining us today and thank you Bree and um, Dean Whalen for having me um, today um, presenting. So with no further ado, let's get going. So telehealth closing the gaps in healthcare. We've heard a lot of how we're doing that currently. So I won't go into a deep introduction. Um, we're gonna have some learning objectives here, of course, and I'll be speaking about more of some of the technologies that are utilized in telehealth. You can go ahead, read next slide. So what is telehealth? Like Dr. Um, Dorn said, Professor Dorn, he mentioned that there's different um, definitions of telehealth, and believe it or not, those definitions vary from state to state. So, um, but what we use in Cincinnati at Cincinnati VA is telehealth is the delivery of health related services using electronic information and telecommunication technologies. So we can move on to the next slide. So a mission of establishing a telehealth program or services in any organization is usually to provide the right care at the right time and use um, technology and resources efficiently to improve access and patient care outcomes. Next slide. Um, there are many values in, in utilizing telehealth as we've discussed throughout these presentations this morning. Um, here in Cincinnati at the VA, they, we can reach our veterans in their home 
and also we have some programs in the local community, um, i.e. the library. Some of our programs um, are established in some rural area library. So, because as mentioned, a lot of patients do not have the technology. So, um, we've partnered with some of the local communities um, resources to provide access to care. Next slide. So um, video conferencing, we talked about video conferencing throughout this, um, these presentations. Um, it includes basically real time um, feed, feedback with the provider and the patient, kind of like what we're doing right now on this platform, this virtual um, type of um, conference now that we're, we're doing. So that's the same as video conferencing with your patient. Next slide. That's an example, that picture is an example of CVT. Um, we term that at Cincinnati VA as clinical video telehealth in the acronym of CVT. Um, as you can see, there's a list of different types of, of specialties that we offer via CVT. Um, next slide. Um, we also offer Storm Forward. Um, Storm Forward is basically a program where a patient can take a picture or image of a specific body part or um, and then forward that to the provider through our electronic health records. Um, those are captured from our staff and then we upload those into the electronic health records where the providers are able to read and diagnose based on those images. Con um, that are, are obtained. Um, this particular service is not um, utilized highly in the, the private sector um, as much as it is in the VA due to cost and coverage for, for store and forward services. But I can see that changing now as we continue to expand um, telehealth in uh, providing services. I know now they, that some provider specialists specifically to dermatologists, they will do a live video feed of um, a patient holding the phone or iPad or laptop to look at images in real time. But as far as storing forward, um, I understand that that is not offered or covered right now in, for insurance. Next slide. Those are just some pictures of um, the storm forward technology that is used. Um, as you can see to the right, you see someone there doing uh, what we call a telespirometry, um, where they're doing a spirometry testing. They blow into that apparatus there, and then those um, that data is then transmitted into the electronic health record for the pulmonologist, and they're able to read those results and provide the primary care provider with guidance as to what needs to happen. So telehealth allows providers um, to work together closely, specialists and primary care providers to work together closely to give the patients the, the services that they need right now versus a patient making an appointment with the, with the specialist and waiting and then finally get an appointment with the specialist. So, um, sometimes, you know, by the time they get through some of these processes, the issues probably have resolved. So um, telehealth allows us to um, address these medical issues immediately. And as you can see below, there's those are different types of programs that um, telehealth can offer as far as storing forward goes. Next slide. Um, there are several mo uh, mobile apps um, that we currently use for telehealth. Some of them are for weight management um, purposes. We also have apps where we um, we have a new app called VA Video Connect. That that app allows the provider to send a message to the patient as far as an appointment. Um, they are able to connect to the provider from that appointment link via that app. So um, it's the secure network. It's different than what we're using now. So it's a secure VA um, network that we use these apps from. Next slide. 
So we have um, several types of technologies. We have wired devices and interactive voice response devices, believe it or not. Some, some of our patients still have landline. So um, we do have home telehealth services that require um, patient to enter data. And those patients who have a landline we provide them with systems where they can plug into that landline. And that information is then transmitted to um, an electronic health records where the nurse case manager is managing whatever specific therapeutic goal um, the provider has with that patient. And where you see interactive voice response, that is, um, uh, go back, next. Yeah, right there. So the interactive voice response, um, that's basically cell phone um, supported. So the patient can enter the information of as it relates to their goals um, in the cell phone. Next slide. So um, we spoke about telehealth services, but there are a lot of folks to the whole, to creating a a whole program for telehealth services because it's not something that is um, directly driven by a provider per se. Um, you need a team. So the, uh, it's important that you have a health informatics personnel, um, some coordinators, just like with any other specialty services, um, telehealth coordinators are, are essential process people to ensuring and, and the stab stability and sustainment of telehealth. Um, biomed engineering, there are some peripherals associated with some of the technologies that um, have to be calibrated and overseen by biomed engineering. Um, the information technology support, when it's like our troubleshooter. So when we have patients that are running into issues or need additional education over um, their device apps or even some of the other um, important things that they need as far as installing their equipment for um, telehealth services. Our information technology support help them with that. Um, telehealth providers, um, we call them telehealth providers because the providers are trained um, to provide telehealth services um, to their, their patients. Um, and we also have telehealth technicians. And um, telehealth technicians are located at all of our clinical um, outpatient-based clinics. So they also um, act as a conduit for the providers and the patients. So they're able to take images for the providers to send to the specialist. They're able to do test calls with the patients prior to their uh, mobile um, visit or their clinical video visit. So um, their role is pretty dynamic. Next slide. So, the change in an organization culture um, is the power of trust. And I say the power of trust because you're working with multidisciplinary services. And I identified those, those services through the last slide as far as the organizational structure. So you're building relationships. So you're establishing that trust early. You're training and growing the staff and the patients simultaneously sometimes. And especially during the pandemic, we saw um that providers were kind of baptized by fire so and so we've 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 experienced challenges just like every other other every other organization who immediately had to start providing telehealth as a pri primary um, access point for patients and as i put it multidisciplinary teamwork that is like the foundation of successful um, telehealth programming Next slide. Um, the common barriers are pretty much the same as uh, spoke to earlier. Um, lack of education for the end user and, and I would say the provider too, because if the providers don't feel confident, then the care that they're trying to convince the, the patient to, to um, receive, the patient's not gonna be receptive to it um, if the providers can't speak to it and feel confident about it. So it's important to, to educate the, the providers and the end users. Um, another barrier is lack of planning. We didn't have much um, room to plan when the pandemic hit for a lot of us. Um, VA has been fortunate because we've been providing telehealth services 
for over 20 years now. So the planning has always been a priority for us and it was very much part of, of contingency planning. And I think now with the pandemic, we'll see an increase of other organization um, adopting this telehealth as part of their contingency planning if they haven't already. Um, there used to be a lot of resistance to change, traditional way of providing care to non-traditional way of providing care. Due, um, due to this pandemic, um, that resistance to change almost became non-existent because patients needed to be seen regardless. So we had a lot of pr providers who previously didn't buy into telehealth, they're, they're clinical champions now. So equipment costs is also a barrier for some facilities and also some patients. So that's why it's important to establish partnerships with community um, and also advocate on the behalf of insurance for our insurance companies and speak to these, these barriers as far as equipment and cost goes for patients who don't have those resources. The more we advocate as professionals, um, the more groundwork and ground we can cover to eliminating some of these barriers. Um, next slide. So um, telehealth billing, that, that's important because especially in the private sector, it's not so much an issue for um, VA, but for the private sector, um, we spoke about those definitions. Every service, every, well, organization has a def specific definition of telehealth and also every state has a different def definition of telehealth. So the definition of telehealth really, uh, it's impacted in what the insurance company will cover. So for the consumer, um, it's important to talk to your insurance company as to what they define as telehealth services and what they would cover and what they would consider reimbursable. So that's why I added that slide because that's an important key factor. Next slide. It's always good to um, kind of check the pulse like I did earlier, just making sure everybody's with me after these presentations. So performance improvement is, is key. We, we've started initiating telehealth at a at a rapid race um, race right now as far as um, facilities adopting these different ways of providing care without much education. So it's as we start to trend down with the kind of the knee jerk um, response to this pandemic, it's time for us to start looking at ways we get improved looking at how we can improve education, looking at how we can improve the platforms that we currently have for patients um, and taking a more systematic approach um, to providing telehealth care so we can sustain and um, move this type of technology forward. Next slide. We talked to the benefits, pretty much kind of similar trend with benefits, travel reduction, we save in costs because also a thing that I haven't heard is that we improve continuity of care. Um, patients who um, are able to utilize telehealth services versus driving into the facility, finding somewhere to park, if they're able to receive their care via telehealth, it improves the continuity. Um, since we the pandemic and we solely had to kind of convert most of our primary care visits to um, telehealth it increased our our clinic utilization to over 150 percent so that speaks volumes to how telehealth can benefit not only the patient but the organization the provider's ability to provide care um next slide Um, as I said, we improve access, patient care outcomes. So, and, and we also, with some of the, the home telehealth programs, we're able to reduce um, readmission rates with those chronic ill patients that we're able to monitor closely um, remotely. Um, I spoke to that briefly, those home telehealth programs, those are, mon are monitored by um, RNs and they're able to work directly with the patients and ensure that they, they're staying in within their um, 
therapeutic guidelines that were outlined by their uh, primary care providers. So we definitely have seen a reduce in readmissions and reduce in emergency care visits for those patients who are suffer with chronic illnesses. Next slide. Um, as I said, telehealth can as, um, assist with access and a key point that I want to make with telehealth and providers is we, we talked a little bit about that with social worker. Every, every patient isn't going to be appropriate for telehealth and it's important as providers and clinicians to note that, um, to do an assessment of the patient, to ensure that the patient is appropriate for um, telehealth because the, the main goal is to have to get act, gain access to that patient to provide them the best care that we can. And sometimes that may not include telehealth as a primary modality. So some patients you will not be appropriate for telehealth. And, and so it's important that as providers, we, we look at that. Next slide. Um, here is just a snapshot of a standard referral process. I think every organization, if you don't have one, should adopt a standard referral process based on the resources that you have at your organization. Um, we utilize electronic health records, and I'm sure a lot of serve, um, sites and organizations do too. So um, there is a referral process with um, specialty providers if uh, a pr primary care provider or even an inpatient provider would like uh, a patient to receive a telehealth visit and they've assessed the patient to and deem them as telehealth appropriate, they initiate that consult. That consult goes to the specialist. The specialist determines um, basically if they want to see the patient that way. Um, or as far as their first visit goes, because some some providers choose not to see the patient um, unless they've established a, a relationship with the patient first, and that's totally up to the clinician and um, they're at their discretion. And then next we move to they will initiate a consult um, electronically. The, the patient is then scheduled. Um, the consult visit takes place and we uh, just like with any other service consults, the patient, we have to get their permission for the service before we initiate it. Um, next slide. I think it's a question slide, isn't it? Any questions? I'm sorry, I try to get through that as fast as possible because we were limited time and I'm sure people will probably want some breaks right now. So, um, <laughs> so. It, please direct all your questions. I'll be happy to ask answer your questions. Yep, put them in the chat box. And um, I know thanks for hanging in, everybody. And we're in the home stretch here. But um, Nietzsche, thank you for your insights. And I, you know, to, to dig into those processes and just the scope of options of telehealth um, technologies out there and considerations. It's um, it's really enlightening just to see the the scope of practice that's available out there. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, so next up we have Jennifer Angeli. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Yeah, it's close enough. Okay. <laughs> um, so are you able to see the slide I can. deck? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so let me read a quick bio for Jennifer. Um, so Jennifer is, again, Jennifer Angeli is a pediatric physical therapist and directs the wellness service line in occupational and physical therapy at Cincinnati Children's. She has classical training in motor control from doctoral degrees in both physical therapy and psychology. Dr. Angeli demonstrates technical facility with kinematic and kinetic data gathering and, and novel statistical approaches to data analysis. She has also completed advanced training in the practice of quality improvement. She has 11 years of clinical specialization in cerebral palsy, aberrant motor motion analysis, orthotics, serial casting, and partial body weight supported treadmill training. As a scientist, Dr. Angeli is recognized for her contributions to patient-centric care and specifically to collaborative goal setting within the clinical encounter. So here's Jennifer. Thanks, everybody. Hi to some people whose names are nice to see on the attendee list here. Um, I talk a little bit about our wellness service line and um, 
true that I direct our wellness service line, but would be remiss not to say that I direct it um, in partnership with Danny Meyer, who I know is um, attending the back to class uh, session today. Also, many years ago, Danny was a student of mine, and uh, and he and I shared some visions for wellness, and now we're working on making those come true together. You can switch three. Um, so, uh, particularly today, and in the context of uh, our president, everything is all things coronavirus, right? Um, but I do want to take just a few minutes to make sure that everybody understands that that's not the only pandemic uh, or public health crisis that we're of. Um, so there's lots and lots of good literature and evidence to support how much people need to move every day um, to prevent the sequela of um, negative health consequences that occur with sedentary behavior. Um, and there's lots and lots of evidence to suggest and support that we aren't achieving those recommendations. So the world has essentially stopped moving, um, and, and the result of that is pretty catastrophic. You can switch. Um, so I would talk first about sort of the cost implications of that. And I apologize, I grabbed this slide from a did uh, last week for the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, and I forgot to switch the perspective line uh, for you, but I'll do that with words. So when you don't move enough, um, it costs a lot of money. Um, and the Centers for Disease Control this year is reporting about $117 billion in healthcare costs associated with not moving. For perspective, because $117 billion is a hard number to wrap your head around um, for you, so never mind that what's written there, please know that you could buy 400, I'm sorry, you could buy 4 million Honda Accords uh, with $117 billion. Or if you were feeling very generous, you could buy a house for every human in Cincinnati and in our neighboring um, community, Dayton, Ohio, and you'd still have money left over in your piggy bank. Uh, that's a lot of money that's spent on um, physical inactivity. You can switch. Um, and then, um, Brianna, this is a video, so if you hover there. Um, so that's economic cost, but there also is human life cost, and I'd like to just share this video with you. Don't know if I have that. I can try to get the link from over here. And then I don't know if, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure that I can get to it. Um, okay. Um, we could share it. We could share the link afterwards. So, like I'm sending a post event email so we could share it. Through that. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, I, I, just, I would encourage you to take a look. It's pretty compelling, and it's actually one that I share uh, a lot for the PTs out there who are listening. Um, I share a lot actually in patient care. So there were a number of thought leaders um, in the early uh, 2010s that began to try to create some sort of movement um, and call to action surrounding physical inactivity among those, the American College of Sports Medicine and Nike, um, and this is a piece that they, um, that they jointly developed about um, the implication, the human life implication of not moving enough. And the bottom line in the movie, uh, in the short video, is that um, for the first time in history, this generation of kids um, is expected to die five years younger um, than our current generation because of physical inactivity. So the video is it's sort of about like, you know, to kids, uh, directed toward kids, and um, it's asking the question, what would you do with five more years? Um, because you're going to lose them because you're not moving enough. Um, so you can switch slides. So, you know, in short, the economics of not moving enough are unacceptable and the human costs are unforgivable. You can switch. Um, I think this is a kind of a really compelling statement here also. So Ruth Peterson is, uh, directs the Nutrition PA obesity, uh, Working Group at the Centers for Disease Control. She says, if you could package physical activity into a the most effective drug in the entire drug in the entire pharmaceutical market. Um, so really compelling. You know, we have to find ways to help people to move. You can switch. Um, and why share that with this particular audience? Um, so 82% of adults with disability um, report that they're more likely to be active if a health care provider simply recommends it. 
So you have the ability to be profound behavior influencers. You can switch. We recognize that uh, here at Cincinnati Children's, and um, and so uh, Be Well is a service line that is our response um, to that sort of call to action. So Be Well is a service line that is community based. It's a wellness series, so it includes sort of lots of different um, flavors and efforts for children, specifically with childhood set debility. Uh, childhood onset disability, and then there should be some additional clicks in here, uh, Brianna. So it's guided by um, my home division, so Cincinnati um, Children's Division of OT and PT, but it's administered um, in large part, you can keep clicking, by local community partners and, and is penultimately supported uh, by both in-kind efforts um, through OTPT, but also by um, philanthropic agencies. So you can switch to Be Well's mission. I think it's important for you to understand sort of where, where we were trying to head here. Um, our effort has always been to provide community-based opportunities um, for daily physical activity, right, in response to this physical activity crisis. Um, and important that it's community-based because we would like not to see kids um, weekly for the rest of their life. We would like to empower them with the skills that they need to then go out and play in their community setting. It's important to us uh, on the Be Well governance team to make sure that we're providing safe and accessible space for everyone, but really important to create sort of this um, bubble of safe space, so an opportunity to practice um, and to participate among similarly abled peers. Um, so it sort of takes, uh, takes away some of the confidence barriers that exist um, in it otherwise existing community settings. We're working to deliver services that are going to foster, of course, physical activity, but also these emotional and social and psychological um, pieces that all would contribute to greater quality of life. And, and we also regard Be Well as an opportunity to create these meaningful connections between families and community partners and of course, ultimately, um, healthcare providers, because what we can do together is far more effective than what any one of us could do ourselves. You can switch. So Be Well, as a service line in 2014 with one kid um, who had cerebral palsy and was, ult was ultimately frustrated with uh, throwing up during uh, the PACER test, um, and was motivated to try to run more effectively. I worked with him on my own um, during off hours and on weekends in like community parks. He chose to run in the Panerathon entirely because they offered a free pair of Skechers. Um, and it, it really start, started with one um, kid and then you can switch. Um, and since then has really, really grown logarithmically. So it went from one to seven to 14 and, and uh, went from one focus, which was running, to many different, um, again, flavors within this um, menu of services. So kids have found, importantly, you know, this safe space to explore uh, new activities and new opportunities. And we've done all sorts of different things. So the running program, but also dancing programs and biking, yoga. Um, Danny's done a really instrumental job in helping to create these sort of one-off uh, exposures where kids learn about um, adaptive and decide if that's interesting to them, and then he connects them to community agencies that will help them to continue that sport or hobby. So uh, basketball, archery, swimming, uh, snow and water skiing, tennis, uh, rock climbing. We've taken kids to um, Kings Island in response to, can you go back for a second, in response to um, an indication that kids are very interested in adventure sorts of activities, laser tag, scuba diving, um, and most importantly, uh, they're reporting that Be Well, um, in one way or another, is improving is improving the quality of their life. So now you can switch. So this is a photo of some um, examples of uh, of wellness and uh, the big adventures that some of our kids have had. You see Danny down there in the bottom left hand corner, racing after a man who'd had a TBI and. Uh, was biking independently again for the first time and then I'm down there at the bottom right next to Danny in the middle helping with some archery although probably not very effectively and you can switch 
And then in 20, so we're doing well, right? We have a lot of momentum. We're very excited. And then in 2020, a pandemic, and you can switch, uh, which was really, you know, a very challenging uh, situation to face because as you can appreciate from those photos, most everything that we did was in-person and group-based. Um, we decided uh, that we weren't to be undone by the pandemic. Um, and importantly, that nothing about well, should really fundamentally change. So our vision and mission and value system uh, would remain fast. You can switch there. And this is a um, this is sort of a little bit of a journey into the the changes that we made. So in the early pandemic months, when essentially the whole world was shut down, Danny and I really took that opportunity as um, one to improve on our processes. So, you know, a lot of what we were doing was very grassroots and sort of scrambled and often in our own time. So for the first time, we had sometimes gaps in patient care um, and less busy moments to actually focus on um, on improving the way we're doing the business of Be Well. Um, so we moved to having actual operation, um, an operational team for wellness and then a governance team for wellness that made sort of the higher level decisions um, and made those into standing uh, meetings. We did a lot of strategic planning. You know, what what did wellness start as and, and where did we hope to take it, um, you know, in the near term and then, you know, many years down the road uh, for Danny and I in our careers. We spent um, time talking about uh, the nature of project management and the systems that we would use to better support Be Well. Um, and so one of those was, you know, shifting much of our um, of our work, of our communication and um, and progress reporting and storing documents into Microsoft Teams, creating meeting wikis where people could very easily access everything there is to know about wellness. Um, quick references to something that we talked about, you know, in last Friday's meeting or so on and so forth and, and shared directories. We evolved um, our infrastructure to sort of a program champion approach. So. The, again, grassroots, Danny and I spent a lot of time on our own uh, leading wellness programs, and now we need to um, more uh, more clearly lead and also pass off um, opportunities to um, see the op daily operations of wellness programs through. And so we're doing that through a sort of program championship model. So he and I will work on a, a new program concept and and getting it off the ground, but then pass off um, to staff therapists um, who will specifically lead the program through its, you know, eight or ten week journey or whatever whatever we're doing. Uh, we spend a lot of time working on um, our approach to making people aware that different wellness events were occurring. So we now have sort of a wellness subscription service where patients and families can say, I want to know about wellness. Keep me subscribed to sort of your wellness channel, if you will. We've moved into sort of more official systems like Campaign Monitor. We're exploring text to subscribe to help people be aware of wellness events. We, of course, responsibly have spent time working on um, funding and the ways in which we can continue to sustain wellness and also spend a lot of time doing culture building. So um, nothing is more frustrating than to really develop a beautiful wellness program and then to have it under enrolled uh, because staff weren't presenting those opportunities to students and families um, or because of lack of awareness. So um, we've really taken advantage of several opportunities to make staff excited about, um, about what the ways in which their um, caseloads might become involved in wellness and really to consider everyone that they're treating actively as a as a patient who is potentially a good wellness uh, candidate, you can switch free. And then we and then we made. Uh, oh, sorry, these are just some examples of those things, right? So um, there's a sort of the FYI or FAQ on um, the program championship approach. There's an example of a meeting wiki and and some work within Campaign Monitor. You can switch free. Um, and then we moved to this actual vir virtual pivot. To conduct, continue to conduct wellness programs. So you can switch again. So the virtual pivot um, took lots of shapes and forms, but when I was thinking about this presentation and sort of the way to um, to clearly illustrate what shifted, I think these are, uh, are maybe the five biggest pieces that we adjusted. So prior to the pandemic, 
all programs would start with a team night uh, where they would meet one another. They would meet the coaches that were going to lead them to the program. They would become familiar with the community partner and the community partner's location. Um, and they would necessarily complete some forms and paperwork uh, that would do things like um, release community partners from uh, liability and ensure that we have um, photo release. Uh, documents on file and so on and so forth. Now all of our programs launch with a drive-through. So families come through in a car, no one gets out of the car, um, and w and the staff are set up um, often in like sort of a station sort of uh, situation where families move through each station and at each station they have a different set of jobs, which might include getting the materials that they need to participate in might include signing these forms, might include picking up swag for, for, for the participation in Be Well and so on and so forth. We had to change our test and measures visit. I didn't say it, but responsibly, um, as a, an EBP <clears throat> institution, we do bookend all of our wellness work with assessment so that we can understand the efficacy of the programs that we're conducting. Um, and they um, have historically had sort of a slant body structure and function on within the ICF on body structure and function on activity and participation. Now, because we can't meet in person um, effectively or safely, uh, at least in the group based uh, scenario, we're doing a lot of work through Microsoft forms um, and more questionnaire based uh, work, but it allows us to continue to assess participation, but importantly, I think to understand more about um, personal factors. Uh, like self-perceived confidence, um, and also a lot of heavy work on um, both baseline and then post-program participation, community participation patterns. So, you know, what are they doing in their community? What are the barriers to participation? And are those changing over the course of participation in a wellness program? So important new, um, new work in assessment that we're excited to, to eventually uh, disseminate. Pre-COVID, we did group-based programs. Post-COVID, most of our programs are now independently completed um, and often include sort of this uh, video-based education that is either live or uh, pre-recorded and then disseminated. Danny and I have turned into animators, so we're learning to wear new hats. Um, we purchased an animation software program and our characters um, in these video-based education series, um, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and I think, you know, penultimately, when the pandemic ends, probably um, useful to the department as a whole to have, you know, developed a new set of skills there. Volunteers typically supported our practices and events. They continue to do that, but now they do it in virtual ways. And I, we think that's really important for both accountability and also for social skills uh, practice. So uh, they're usually assigned to a wellness participant and in the ways in which the families prefer they would engage in at least weekly contact. So it might be um, just text messages, it might be snail mail, um, and it might be something like a Zoom, but they're, they're continuing to contact and, and see in their own way uh, the wellness, participate, wellness participant and, and to nudge them along on the journey. Um, and re related but different, um, it, we did find in some of our uh, wellness data that a lot of really nice um, social benefits were occurring from participation in wellness programs, which in hindsight was probably predictable, but not not a, not a historically analyzed. We did not want to lose the benefits um, of social confidence and interpersonal relationship building that were occurring with wellness. And so now um, it, during COVID, we have team Zoom calls. So for example, we had a gardening program the Zoom calls were called Zoom Blooms. We are currently running a hiking program. Those are called Trail Tales. And that's a chance for the kids truly just to have fun socializing with one another. And then lastly, um, we did you know, track attendance at wellness events so that we could understand who's coming so that we can then back and understand when you're looking at who made gains, is it closely tied to how often they're participating in wellness? And now, much of the work of understanding if pe people are actively participating in virtual wellness things comes from uh, selfies. So we often have families, uh, you know, if they're taking a hike, take a selfie on the hike and they're sending it back to our OTPT Be Well um, inbox. Um, and then we're using that to, to kind of get, get, gather a metric of, um, of the degree to which they're participating in wellness. You can switch free 
these are pretty fast, which is at the end here. So to date, we've run three wellness programs. We've done this run, we've done a running uh, okay, training program. We've done a gardening program, and we're currently in the middle of a hiking program. Um, and you can switch again. So we've been running active programming for about four months, and we've now served uh, more than 40 kids through wellness just, just within this four month uh, period. So the volume of kids that we're serving is, um, again, logarithmically bigger than it was pre-COVID. It's interesting that um, in the context of a pandemic, the demand for wellness you know, has markedly increased. And because of the pretty tight um, assessment approach that we've chosen to retain. We have really wonderful real-time statistics on like the socio-demographics, who are we serving in wellness. We've got a really nice functional snapshot of kids. So we have some understanding of mobility and um, hand-arm use, vision, their visual abilities, um, communication ability, and then also eating and drinking. We have some uh, measures of catchment, and so we can now clearly see that um, because of the pandemic, um, but continued participation in wellness, our catchment area is much larger. We're serving kids from further away. Uh, we continue to have um, indices of goal attainment. We continue to have program-specific measures. We've got this new data on community participation patterns, and for the first time, we're collecting um, a measure of um, just sort of program endorsement. So this is a net promotion is a metric that helps you to understand how likely a person is to recommend wellness to someone else. Um, so a really rich um, and promising set of data there. And you can switch again, Bree. And then anecdotally, I'll share a couple things with you. Um, the program is, family says program is um, especially motivation, motivating to, has quite a great motivation to move during this highly unusual summer. There's another family that says we've been nearly 100% isolated. Um, and that would have been intensely lonely were it not for the Be Well program. And you can switch again, free. That's just a couple snapshots. There's Danny on the left. That's after the 5K program. And there's a participant in the gardening program on the right. And you can switch one more time, Bree. So this is sort of where we're headed. So we're kind of right in the middle of that figure. So we finished, we're, sorry, we're in the throes of hiking. We're getting ready to launch a program called Groove, which is like a music making and dance wellness program. Then we will do some cooking and some yoga and some martial arts to get us through winter months. And then we'll be back to the spring and we'll sort of reassess whether we're looking at virtual work again in the springtime or if we're able to sort of um, go back to some of our older trajectories and revisit um, in-person spring events. And you can switch one more time. And so this is the last slide, which is just um, to say uh, that uh, in the context of the pandemic, it was, it's really been a rich um, learning opportunity and a chance for, for Danny and I to really explore um, and feel excited about the successes we've enjoyed because uh, despite the fact that health is a tricky thing to find right now, uh, wellness is very much in demand. Uh, and that's all I have. Perfect. So thank you so much for such a comprehensive example. Um, you know, Danny's on our planning, he's got a lot of shout outs. Um, Danny's on our planning committee. He's one of our PT alumni. Um, you know, when he brought up this example as an opportunity to share, I just was so excited from the start to hear about it and um, just really appreciate everything you're doing on the ground to to model what it, you know, to to have it be a, a more than, you know, not just, you know, we have to get to this, but there's other things that we can do to reach our patients. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for your time. And um, we were last but not least, thank you, Sarah, for hanging in. <laughs> we're in the home stretch. Um, so Sarah is going to speak to nutrition. Um, I'll read a short bio real quick for her. So Sarah Lumber graduated from UC in 2016 with a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition. Sarah has experienced working with patients on everything from weight loss to fertility, seizure management, with Kroger Health, who is an expert on how patients can benefit from food as medicine approach to nutrition, all while maintaining their lifestyle and livelihood. In her spare time, she leads a nonprofit focused on providing basic needs and creating a better future for children in India, Kenya, and locally in Cincinnati. So, thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Okay, awesome. I was having issues with that earlier, so apparently I solved the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, like you just heard, my name's Sarah. I work for Kroger Health, and I've been working for Kroger Health 
for the past four years. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about our telenutrition platform, our telehealth platform, and how we utilize different resources and technology um, to give our patients the best experience. Next slide. So we can probably skip this slide. This is just a little bit more uh, about me. Um, currently, I'm the Kroger Health Connect Dietitian Supervisor um, is my current role. So I supervise the dietitians um, on our field team. Next slide. This is just a picture of our team. Whenever I talk about telehealth, or we call it telenutrition at Kroger, I just like to point out that we're real people, we're real dietitians with real education and who truly care about the needs of our patients. I think a lot of times when you think virtual or televersions of health, people think a hologram, you know, they think way into the future with really it's here and now real people um, treating people um, it, and on an individual and personal level. Next slide. I wanted to just give a brief, brief history of what Kroger Dietitians did, and I thought the best way to do that was through some pictures. So as you can see, we were very, really involved in the community, involved in our stores, involved in different promotions. So we did large events. We used to do grocery store scavenger hunts like you see on TV, media segments. We've always been involved in our product development at Kroger with our brands, as well as you'll see in the top right there. Ashley Martinez, one of our dietitians, working with our meal kits. We're involved with the little clinic and pharmacy, um, doing cooking demos, and then showing people around the store, showing them how to shop for healthy food and, um, and make, make healthy selections right inside the aisles, right where their food decisions are made. Next slide. So why telehealth? The great thing um, about telehealth is that we can reach people wherever they're at. So our goal is to simplify healthcare for customers around the country. We are um, a nationally licensed program. So we have dietitians licensed in all 50 states, which really helps our reach and allows us to see people um, even in places where Kroger is not at. We're bringing food as medicine from the grocery store to the comfort of our customers' homes which just creates an environment that our patients can see us where they feel comfortable. Um, they, it allows them to feel safe where they're at during COVID and pre-COVID and post-COVID as well. It's convenient, personalized nutrition counseling. Everything we do is individualized to that person, that person's specific needs, whether it's their specific health condition, their living situation, or their, their place in life, it's always individualized to their needs. Next slide. What are the main differences between virtual and in-store appointments? The thing to point out is they're, they're still face-to-face. -face. We do everything through, through video chat. We do have some patients who will do appointments over the phone. Sometimes it's for their own convenience or sometimes it's just uh, everyone kind of touched on lacking technology resources. So we are able to do them over the phone, which helps overcome that barrier. Patients are not physically existing in the same place, so we have to make sure we minimize distractions. So whenever we do telenutrition visits, um, we follow all, all HIPAA compliances. We're in, uh, in a special room um, without any windows or any distractions or anyone's able to access it. As you probably are thinking now from what I said in the beginning, it's a different store tour experience. What we do is we utilize Kroger.com, which I'll talk about in just a minute, to help patients shop for healthy foods. A lot of people now in the COVID age are shopping online anyway, and so we can help them utilize those resources as well as show them how do I tell the nutrition, what, where do I get the nutrition facts, how do I know if this is healthy or not for me if I'm not physically touching the product before I buy it. It's important that we know our banner stores. Kroger uh, is, has a lot of banner stores all around the country, so knowing where that person does shop, as well as we have the option to use Kroger Ship for areas in which Kroger is not a physical location for them, we can ship non-perishable items through our Kroger Ship program. Next slide. There's varying ways of communications. It's important to do different things, like give people time to respond, as sometimes there's a lag time on the video, or sometimes they're thinking, but you don't necessarily know that they're just taking time to think because you can't see their full body movement. 
want to minimize talking with our hands. I am a talk hand talker, um, very expressive person. So working to not do this and distract people during our visits is really important, making it feel as natural as possible at the same time. Looking at the webcam, not the screen, being smile or having a smile and being really friendly and working to build that rapport with your patient, even though you might not be in the same place, there's always things you can connect over. If nothing else, you can always connect over the pandemic. Post appointment information and follow ups a little bit different as well. Instead of using physical handouts, we use we email handouts through secure file transfer. And it's important, even though you're not physically with this person, to be prompt in sending that follow up um, and do the pro proper follow up procedures. Next slide. These are just two examples of the different programs we have going on right now in our marketing material. On the left, you'll see our nutrition counseling flyer there. This is what we were using. Pre COVID, pre COVID, we were doing in store consults with our patients and doing store tours with our patients and customers. However, we were also doing telenutrition to reach those people who might not be close to our physical location or it was just more convenient for their schedules. They could see us during their lunch hour um, and not have to travel to us or really any time that worked for them. On the right side, you'll see we have our, our COVID flyer where we announce free dietitian led telenutrition services. This is something that Kroger really thought was important to utilize as a relief program for the COVID pandemic. As I'm sure all of you guys know, it has not been easy in many different ways, but nutrition has been a struggle due to food security, having to buy groceries for longer periods of time, having to figure out how to create meals on your own. People are cooking for the first time at home because they weren't able to go out to eat as frequently. So we were able to provide this service to people in a time when they needed it most. Next slide. Next, I'm going to go into kind of what the telenutrition experience looks like, just so you guys can get a taste of it. Just so you guys know, you can always go to KrogerHealth.com. Anyone is welcome to sign up for a visit, whether you just, you know, maybe you have a chronic disease or maybe you just want to learn how to cook healthy foods. Maybe you're someone who wastes a lot of food every week and you want to learn how not to do that or create, you know, new flavors, new, new meals, and just learn about nutrition. Anyone is welcome. Next slide. This is how it starts. Like I said, you can go to the littleclinic.com forward slash dietitians or KrogerHealth.com. They actually lead you to the same place, but it's really simple. If you guys ever know anyone or have anyone or yourself wants to see a dietitian from Kroger, you just go to this website and schedule your video chat. Next slide. Then what it'll, it'll do is it'll prompt you to provide some information. It's really nice having this option online. It takes out a lot of barriers to having people sign up, having them to call in, gather their information where they can just simply do this on their own, as well as this helps us know what state the patient is located in because we do have to be licensed in that state. So we have to pair them up with the right dietitian. Next slide. Next, it'll prompt you to either pick an available date or time or available dietitian. We like to give this option to still make it personal for the, the patient so they can decide, read the bios of our different dietitians and decide who they want to see. Or if it's more convenient for them, say they need a 7 p.m. appointment on a Tuesday, they can easily look that up as well. Next slide. So like I said, this is just scheduling at your own time. You'll see there's always plenty of days and plenty of dates available. Next slide. And this is probably one of my favorite parts of the process. Like I said, it's important to build that rapport with your patient. And this is a good first step is we all have our, our names, our pictures, real people. That is the first that picture goes with that person in their bios to learn a little bit about the dietitian. So people can connect with them before they even get to their first appointment and pick someone who they think will really help meet their needs and they can connect. Next slide. The other great thing about telenutrition is everything is automated, which gives our practitioners, um, our dietitians, a lot of time back in their schedule because they're not doing administrative work, whereas the computer takes care of all of it, which gives us more time facing the patient and really truly helping. Next slide. 
Next slide. This is just a slide saying we know you're busy. We'll remind you before your appointment, meaning that, like I said, everything's done electronically. We do our best to make this a priority in their lives um, by helping them make it as simple as possible. Next slide. And this is just an example um, of a dietitian giving um, an appointment. Obviously, that's not a real appointment. <laughs> this is just an example where you can, the patient will physically see their dietitian. They'll talk to their dietitian. It's the same as being in person, just through a screen instead, which makes it really individualized and personal for that patient. Next slide. So shopping online. As I said earlier, we used to shop in the store with our patients and our customers. And this is really, really important and really um, a standout of our program. All of our dietitians are product experts. So if you are looking for a certain product, we can help you find it. If there's a product you love, um, cookies are my favorite food. I will never deny that. <laughs> but what we can do is help you find a healthier version of it, maybe a version with less saturated fat or more fiber in it. And this is how we used to do it in the aisles but now we can do it online. We share our screens with our patients and our customers and simply look up different products. You know, if we're trying to increase dairy, we'll maybe look up a healthy yogurt. The great thing about shopping online is you can also see the nutrition facts of any of our, any of our foods and help them read the labels and show them what to look for. So if we're doing a yogurt, for example, how to look for a low sugar yogurt, um, and one that doesn't have a lot of extra fat in it as well. We can also show them how to create lists to save some of their favorite products. So it makes the shopper experience a lot easier for them and a lot more convenient. So instead of, you know, you go into the grocery store and we all have our go-tos, we know where things are at in the aisle. Um, it, it makes it easy. This does the same exact thing just on the online version, as well as if they like, they can put it directly into their cart and buy it that day. Next slide. So Kroger.com is one of our main our main technology resources that we use in order to help people shop for healthy foods and really make what physicians and people are recommending to them practical in a, a take home version of that. The other thing I'd love to introduce you guys all to is our opt up app. If you guys don't have the opt up app, I would highly, highly recommend you download it. You don't have to be a Kroger shopper um hopefully you are but you don't have to be in order to use it it does work in other stores as well the opt up app is a way to help people pick and select better for you options in the store i mentioned my cookie example before um when if i'm buying a cookie um, from the bakery which is my personal favorite what opt up will do is show me better for you options the important thing is it's not going to tell me to eat an apple instead, although I do know that would be a much better option than my cookie. It's going to give me a healthier cookie option compared to the one I'm using. Next slide. This gives a little bit more in-depth information about UpDup. So we will utilize this with our patients. The way it works is it'll link to your Kroger loyalty card. So you never technically have to enter any data into the app, which is a huge barrier for, typically a huge barrier for people that we were able to overcome with this opt up app. If you see the cell phone all the way to the right, you'll see the score of 704. There, that's the dashboard that gives you an overall rating of what your groceries were and um, what you purchased. So any score over 600, which is based on based on like an average that we've come up with and calculated, we want the score to be over 600 for your your purchases. You'll see at the bottom there. There's different levels. So green, yellow, and red. Greens are foods that we want to eat all the time. Yellow are foods that we want to eat in moderation, and the reds are foods that we just want to make sure we're eating occasionally. These scores were. Um, created by our, our expert registered dietitians, as well as different algorithms, focusing on things like fat content, types of fats, healthy versus unhealthy fats, sugar content, sodium content, fiber content, um, you name it, nutrition, it's factored into here. If you see the cell phone all the way to the left, this shows the purchases that someone bought, and you'll see that there's different colors and different numbers next to them. So it's a little hard to see, I apologize, it's smaller on this screen, 
But for example, I believe there's a granola bar that has a rating of a 28. What you can do is you can um, tap that granola bar and you'll get a screen like you will in the middle here. And at the bottom, it'll show better for you options for that person. So it might show an, an option with more fiber, an option with less sodium in it for that person. The other great thing is you can compare products. So a lot of our customers will say, you know, they go into the store and they see the bread aisle and it's just, there's a million and one options and they don't know what to do. What you can do is you can actually take, take your phone with the app on it and scan the barcode, which is what you can do in other stores as well if you're not a Kroger shopper. Once you scan the barcode, it'll bring up the product and then there's a compare button. So you can compare it to other to other products. So you can even take another picture or scan another barcode and use that, or it can bring up different options for you. So you can see them side by side and it'll give you information on why to choose one over the over the other. There's also different aspects to the app incorporated, such as if people's trying, if people are trying to stick to a keto diet, uh, a vegetarian diet, a vegan diet, it'll give them specific recommendations for that as well. This has been a really great tool to use with our patients because it, it shows what they buy, it shows what they like, and it helps us make recommendations based off of that. Not just random recommendations that maybe is something they've never heard of or they never even would want to try. It gives us what they like and helps us find easy, simple solutions that aren't going to overhaul their life, but make simple changes to have big impacts on their needs. Next slide. And then I, I think this actually leads into all of our questions. I'm not sure. Um, but if you guys have any questions for me, you can always feel free to reach out to me personally. I'm happy to answer them. I think that throughout this presentation, everyone has done a great job of showing how they use telenutrition. And I think it's really cool to see a group of people who have adapted to help their patients and help the, the people they serve during, during this crazy time. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was it was great to kind of get into the practical world that you live in every day of um, how to make better choices considering the environment. So, um, yeah, I really appreciated the, the opportunity to hear about what your team's doing. And I saw a couple other familiar faces of alumni on your team. Um, so, yeah, we'll take these last few minutes. Um, technically, the two and a half hour mark for CE was at um, 1235, um, but we did have a few pointed questions in the chat that I'd like to address real quick. So hopefully we would still wrap up here in the next few minutes. Um, so the first, so actually our questions were from Chuck um, and they were pointed directly during certain presentations, but then if anybody else wanted to answer on the panel, um, you would be welcome to. So the first one was during Aaron Riedel's presentation, um, asking if there was any data that could be published at this point. Um, so, and then that, you know, after Aaron goes, if any other panelists wanted to speak to um, any kind of data and publishing opportunities. I can't hear you, Aaron. I don't know. Let's try again. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I, I double muted my phone and my computer to make sure you, I didn't accidentally say anything, but then I forgot to unmute. I think it depends on how you would want to present the, the data. Do we have data that I would say are definitive effectiveness types of data? No. Do we have data about the number of visits we had, the, you know, the ratings of the um, clinicians as they were being trained and their ability to do it? Could you compare that to um, clinicians at similar points in their training who did all, you know, face-to-face? Therapy, yes. So, I mean, I, I think there's some potential for that. I hadn't really thought of that. So, um, I thank you for that question. Um, and if you want to maybe connect offline, we definitely can do that. Great, thanks. Did any other panelists want to talk about um, the data you're collecting and if there's any potential to publish? I mean, so this is Jen and Jelly. So, for, you know, from the wellness um, perspective, that's just sort of part of daily life um, here. So I think we in, we intend to look at um, just the beauty of that forms approach to data collection is that everything is sort of right there and um, and summarized for you. So we would be remiss not to at least do some reporting on um, the virtual pivot, but also on 
um, community participation patterns and specifically um, what people are reporting uh, are barriers to participation. Um, and then uh, we, we, of course, also always pay attention to efficacy. So I think we for sure would intend to, to summarize and share professionally. Perfect, thank you. Any other panels want to speak to that question or we can go to the next? Um, Perfect. So the next question was during Loan's presentation, but again, anyone can respond. Um, so talking about the challenges we're facing it is, and that you were talking about. Um, so the question was, is the biggest challenge with the technology or with the absence of in-person human action interaction? Um, I think that it intertwined. It's both that sometimes the technology um, makes the relationship or the connection um, uh, disruptive, right? That sometimes um, the the connection level, like there's a lag time on the virtual screen and uh, on the screen. Sometimes in therapy or in clinical work, we rely very much on um, the dynamic between the clients. Sometimes the nonverbal information, and um, when the screen freezes, um, so it. Um, I try not to look at myself and then that's disruptive too to then see yourself, but that the client see um, in such a way that they see your face and they see um, the freezing of the pain makes it um, really jarring and difficult. Um, on the one hand, it's both of these that because of virtual sessions that you can, you feel so close to your client, you're just literally in each other's face and yet you're so far away. And there is an issue of connection that you're right there, but then there is a barrier in between that you can really feel it. Whereas in the room, um, you can sit um, six feet apart or you can sit farther away. And yet the facilitation of that environment allowed you to feel like you're there together with your client. And so the challenge then, how do you translate that? How do you make that um, environment be um, just as available on the screen? And the technology sometimes disrupts that um, because of the lagging time or because of the connectivity. If, if I might add, that the, the reason why I asked that question is, you know, when you go to the see your doctor, he or she's, you know, usually, um, I'll use my video as an example. If it comes up, he's usually looking this way. See, I'm not actually facing you. And the problem with that, and we've actually seen this in many telemedicine and telehealth uh, applications, is they're, that you're not actually making eye contact, right? And I think the way, like right now, I mean, I'm looking at my monitor, but the camera's up here. And so it always makes it a little more challenging because you obviously want to have that human interaction but some physicians have said over the last 30 some years I've been doing this, they really like to see the patient to maybe, I, I mean, not, I mean, they, they may put their hand on their knee and go, you know, Mrs. Smith, everything's going to be just fine. You can't do that yet. I mean, there are technologies out there, haptic interfaces that allow you to reach out across thousands of miles and touch someone, but it's not it's for sale yet. So this idea of um, being able to do that, that's why I asked the question. The other, the first question, the reason why I wanted to know about data being published is that there, if you take 10 academic institutions or 100 you know, institutions doing similar things, they're not aware of it. So you're repeating the same work, which in some ways is wasting money, but you're not learning from one another. And that's why it's always important, I think, to get that information out there. That's why I asked the first question. So I'll go back on yeah. mute now. Yeah, and I think that um, there is so much about the technology in terms of how you position yourself and what you look at so that you maintain eye contact with your patient. Um, and something as minute as how long can you sustain the eye contact and how long does a client do that? And sometimes depending on where my clients are calling from or, or connecting from that whatever is their own, so much of their life is right there in front of the screen too and who's there and 
and what kind of uh, interruptions that there might be. Um, so the lighting and, and all of that technicality comes into play as well. Yeah. That's why it's, a, it's too important to um, train the, the providers and, and um, prepare our patients prior to the visit as to what to expect. Um, just like any other test, and that's kind of the point that I was making, like we, we don't lose sight of our, our judgment and our clinical judgment um, in the same way that you would face a patient in person, you would face the camera and look at the patient. And there are some housekeeping rules that providers have to establish prior to those visits to ensure confidence of the patient and also the provider that this can be done. Um, so, with the performance improvement moving forward, kind of what you mentioned, Bo, is basically part of your PI would be to identify what were your barriers with freezing the screens, working with OINT, um, your information technology department, as to how you could um, eliminate or minimize some of those barriers, because it could be bandwidth based on where the location of the patient is that could be impacting that, that connectivity, which may eliminate them from being a candidate for telehealth altogether. So those are those are the things um, that you want to identify and keep track of as far as um, how uh, Chuck was mentioning with publishing. Um, the more yeah. we, we talk about these things and, and highlight them, the better we'll be in providing these types of services. Perfect, thank you. Um, the one last question we had, Chuck, I don't know if you want to ask Jenny directly about um, if you, about the Wii apps or gaming of increasing utility with what they're doing, um, or if you wanted to expand upon that. Yeah, so, I mean, there's been some work um, both here in the United States and around the world about using uh, platforms like the Wii, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, um, and then there's mobile apps. And we did a study about nine, eight or nine years ago about te telemental health apps here in Ohio and you know, how people had access to bandwidth and they didn't have access to bandwidth. And I'm just curious in the work that you're doing and the work you're going to be looking for forward to doing in the future, how much of those kinds of things are increasing utility uh, and how much the patients are becoming more familiar with it. So you can do a lot of, of uh, things with a Wii, for instance, uh, with people in wheelchairs or, or, or children with uh, physical handicaps that they can actually participate in things like bowling or tennis or or even you know jogging on even though they're you know, confined to a wheelchair they can still jog along a path and follow sort of an icon yeah i i mean i think it's very interesting work and um and not at all at odds with the idea of wellness it's central to be well has always been um the community and so for that reason, we've tried to develop programs that will move kids with disability into community settings um, and to help them develop a measure of confidence and facility, you know, navigating those areas um, so that potentially perceived barriers uh, begin to mitigate. Uh, but penultimately, you know, I think you, you use whatever tools you have at your disposal facilitate um, physical activity in the name of reducing the public health crisis that is occurring. I haven't personally done any work um, with we the, the closest um, sort of like personal fitness work that we've done has been just sort of piloting the use of Fitbit uh, in the name of um, of data collection. Um, but we do, you know, we do have um, those devices uh, here at Children's and, and you're working with a pediatric population they're voting they're very motivating so that you know they're worth studying and 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 learning more um and and perhaps in some um related vein to be well you know would be worth exploring and then if we do that we certainly should talk more to you because wellness has for us become more about um quality of life and less about just physical activity so you know if you were using we for sort of mental health uh gains that would be exciting to learn more about thank, thank you Perfect. Well, thank you so much. In the interest of time, we'll wrap this up. Um, if you have any other questions, um, 
I'm happy to share the, the contact information or forward your question to our presenters. But um, thank you to all of our participants as well today. We loved bringing you together to hopefully support your um, access to CE. I know in this weird, the other thing with this weird time is um, those opportunities and we're excited to help bring that to you. So um, the link to the evaluation is in the chat box right now. Um, I will also be sending a post event email early next week. And then here in the next few days, I'll be working on sending out the CE certificate. So um, in that post event email, it has you know a prompt if you didn't get your certificate, reach out to me. So I'll work with you on um, on all of that. So thank you again for your presence and participation today. And I, I know I learned a lot of just all the different utilities out there and how we can all navigate this um, really challenging environment together. So thank you all for joining us today and um, happy homecoming and go Bearcats.